Jong Sang-woo is your typical college student in South Korea, one who dreams of a life full of wealth, one who always wishes to be able to do multiple things at once at his convenience. To party, to travel, to be in a relationship, to play games, and to make money. This ambition of his resulted in him being awakened at the 10th Portal Awakening program that he is currently attending at the moment. To be awakened means to unlock the manner that the people were exposed to be able to have an awakening, making them cross over a portal. With this they unlock certain skills that they can use for either daily activities or hunter work. As the program was being spearheaded by an A-rank hunter named Park Wante, Sangwoo finally gets his turn to be awakened. He was instructed by one of the proctors to leave all his gadgets in order to cross the portal. Once he crossed over the portal he was confirmed by the system as well during his transfer, he woke up in a bunker with other participants of the program. Others were already showing skills that were really impressive. One woman on his side was able to summon a phoenix-like creature for a brief moment only to be hoarded by a bunch of men from guilds who were trying to recruit new members. As he was standing up, he was approached by a nearby guild recruiter and asked him how is he feeling and what skill he might have awakened. Sangwoo then checked his status window only to find below average stats and a skill called cloning, a casting type skill together with a clone strengthening passive skill. The skill effect is literally the name itself. The user will be able to summon a clone with a 24 hour cooldown. The passive skill means half of his stats are applied to the clone he has summoned. He was then again asked by the recruiter regarding the skill he attained and he informed that it was cloning. The recruiter seemed to be a little disappointed but did not realize it was cloning and misunderstood it for an illusion cloning, skill in which the clone cannot physically do anything unlike Sang was attained skill. The recruiter was still trying to cheer him up and advised him to at least show his skill to the officials so he would get an accurate judgment. Looking at those who presented earlier, Sang Woo felt pressured and decided to look for the exit. The recruiter told him that he just needed to see the exploring troop in order to be scanned and registered so that he could go back to the portal. At the exit, he was informed overall of his skills and was told that there was a 73% chance of having one or more skills to be unlocked. During the time all of his stats and skills were being registered, information was sent to his identification bracelet. He then goes back to his apartment where his PC was left AFK on this online MMORPG he was playing. As he lay on his bed, he remembered that he forgot to pay his tuition and rent for the month, thinking of getting a part-time job but also wanted someone to work in his place instead of him. He remembered his cloning skill. Sangwoo then stands up and concentrates. Then a sudden surge of energy flows out of his body and an exact clone of him shows up. As the summoned clone appeared in front of him without any clothes on, he was surprised and examined it a little bit, with some small talk and questions that the clone immediately answered. He then did some simple commands which the clone immediately responded, finding that he didn't have to command it verbally, and it had the same stamina as him. He received a text message from his college friend Jiangdu who brags about getting two skills at his awakening program, completely forgetting that his clone is still doing the command he gave causing him to earn a small stat point in stamina. In another place, the jumper, George Lucas, an S-rank level hunter from the U.S., and the leader of the Enlightened Guild in the United States, is the first to conquer Odin's infamous tower dungeon. In his guild's headquarters, he gets informed by his secretary that 80% of the 300 million population have been awakened with an estimate of achieving 100% in the next five years considering the trend of the participants in the awakening program. As he looks outside of his building headquarters, seemingly expecting of what it is to come. Back in South Korea, some runners and joggers are surprised by an individual who does not stop running at a park. Amidst the hot season he is still running with his hoodie on, never taking a day off. He was then offered water by an old woman who also exercises in the area, but he didn't respond and just went back to running. People did not know that it was Jong Sangwoo, except that the one doing the exercise was his clone. After a month, Sangwoo realized that he had lost some weight and felt the changes that his clone did during exercises. His stats gradually improved bit by bit, and has more understanding of how his cloning skill actually works, its limits, benefits, and other information such as his clone not being able to use the clone skill itself. He then checks out Hunter Wiki on the internet. It is the site where people who are awakened check out more information about awakening, stats, 
and even items they could buy to improve their skills. He then read from the website that the stats that he earns are not that easy to attain by mere training, in which he gives thanks to the clone that he makes. There is also a category of special stats like regeneration, resistance, vitality, and willpower, but the way to acquire these is mostly unknown at the time. As he looked at his status window, he noticed the slight differences of his stats being subpar to being in a level in which he can move more with less stamina expended. He thought about training with his clone but decided immediately not to do to the hellish training it undergoes. He then picked up a gym advertisement flyer and then looked at the MMORPG he was playing and thought that he could be the brains and his clone would be the bronze. After paying for his tuition for college, Sang Wu finds himself in a situation in which he really needs money. Due to the fact that he had mostly spent his budget on food during the last couple of days, especially now that his main source of income has dried out. He decided to look for physical labor jobs on the internet so he could be able to earn money while also working on his stamina since giving complicated orders to his clone might run into some problems in the future. He then finds part-time work at a distribution center, the wage is decent, and it would be a good exercise for him as well. He immediately calls the number provided on the job opening and gets the job instantly. He was also asked if he can work today and he agreed since he really needed funds as quick as possible. He arrived at the location, along with number one, his clone. Sangwu instructed his clone that he would only speak when spoken to and that his work name is Jiangdu. He found a familiar face who is Mr. Diakshil who is his friend who works in the facility as well. Sangwu was not immediately recognized due to his weight loss and the sudden change of appearance. Diakshil then pointed out where he should go for the part-time job. Sangwu then musters up his confidence and then proceeds to go in with his clone inside the facility. All that confidence at first was somehow lost as Sangwu is just exhausted and tired from all the hard labor in the warehouse facility, as if there was no end to the boxes they should deliver. His clone on the other hand, together with the other employees seems to be just holding their ground well. He thought that his clone should just be there and not him since it is clearly doing fine. Lunch break came with Sangwu clearly showing signs of exhaustion. Mr. Diakshio hands him and Jiangdu some soda. Diakshio praises them for getting far since usually, all newcomers quit on the first day. Diakshio also asks Sangwu how was he able to attend the university, and Sangwu explains it was through some certifications and special admissions. Mr. Diakshio then offers him another gig which is to be a private tutor for her daughter, he offers him a good amount which Sangwu immediately accepts. Mr. Diakshio said that he would also be talking about this matter to his wife and daughter and would contact him later on. After their conversation, Sangwu looks for his food but he sees his clone casually eating it all. The next day, Sangwu wakes up with his whole body in pain due to the labor work he did at the warehouse facility. Looking at his stats that is still gradually increasing due to his clone exercising outside, he decides to command his clone to return and prep up for the next task as he was finishing breakfast. He tried unlocking the special stat of regeneration by pricking his clone's finger with a needle following an instruction from the HunterWiki website's forum. Later on, Sangwu left with a couple of commands to his clone, including a phone since he was now on his way to the gym for his own exercise routine. As he was passing by the avenue, someone put his arm around him and it was Kim jong Du, his college friend who was actually surprised by the sudden change of his appearance due to weight loss. Jiangdu decided to come with Sangwu believing that the gym he will be going to is cool and has a girl trainer they would like. Upon arriving at the gym, Sangwu was then greeted by one of the employees. After registering for three months they went ahead and exercised. Jiangdu easily bench presses 50 kilograms and all the people in the gym were shocked. He also revealed that his strength stat is at 2.1 and he also has a strength boost skill which he received at his awakening program. Seeing this Sangwu wonders how strong the other high-profiled hunters are. Sangwu receives a call from Mr. Diakchil asking if he could go to their apartment and talk with his daughter to convince her to take tutoring lessons. Sangwu then proceeds to Mr. Diakchil's apartment and hears screams from Mr. Diakchil's daughter who is complaining about the tutoring services and tells her dad to cancel it right away. Mr. Diakchil argues about it as he rushes outside the door which it slams into Sangwu who is eavesdropping. Everybody was surprised as Mr. Diakshil's daughter sees Sangwu at the front of their door. After the accident, 
Sangwoo finds himself inside Mr. Diaxio's apartment. He is then greeted by his wife, Mrs. Jang, who serves them some food at the table while telling him that he looks like a different person due to his recent weight loss. After they exchange greetings, he then proceeds to greet their daughter named Heian. Mr. and Mrs. Jang, on the other hand, are making fun of their daughter who is blushing as Sangwoo evaluates her grades while Heian is flustered since she thought Sangwoo heard the commotion earlier. Sangwoo is surprised by how bad her grades are but is still positive that there is room for improvement as they agreed to go ahead and study right away. Sangwoo gets back to his apartment and notices that his clone is still at the warehouse facility doing its work. He thoughts about Heian being better than what he expected, despite the grades she showed him earlier. Sangwoo then realizes that the spare phone won't be enough once he could summon more clones later on. He then proceeds to look into the Hunter website to look for related skills and items for his cloning, only to be shocked at how the prices are ridiculously high, thinking that he would rather buy a house than buy those items. Sangwoo then contemplates that he would have to save his whole life for those items, and wonders how hunters could afford these items. He looked at the news and it was all about hunters making a fortune and being at the height of success all over them. Realizing that he didn't get those awesome skills just to load trucks, he musters up his confidence and decides to be a hunter, as he unlocks vitality as one of his special stat. Now, what are hunters? In 2000, almost all of humanity was wiped out due to portals that suddenly opened across the world with monsters flooding out of it which is called the Great Disaster. It led to the population of the world being cut in half but then, superhumans showed up with powers that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the monsters that appeared around the world. With them at the forefront, humanity was barely able to come out victorious. Now the people who are still killing the remaining monsters in the world are known as hunters. As Sang Wu headed to the hunter center to register, he also looked at videos on the internet on how to qualify and pass as a hunter. He only had a couple of hours of sleep due to his preparation but thanks to his vitality skill he unlocked, he feels more better than yesterday. The Hunter Center building has a variety of stalls. From items to recruitment but with only a small amount of people to register, as Sangwoo heard the announcement about where the qualification exam would be taken, he then proceeded to it. Despite being quite nervous, he opens the door and says his greetings but sees scary-looking people which shocks him. The proctor of the exam then appears and introduces himself. He is Myung Huan Han, who will be overseeing everything at the exam. He instructed that there will be three parts of the exam which are a writing, performance, and aptitude exam, and that anyone who will be caught cheating will be automatically disqualified with a one-year ban from taking the exam. Now, the hunter exam begins. On a busy street, Jun Mo Khan, who is an agency representative from JM Agency, is having a problematic financial conversation over the phone. Despite the issue, he is still showing his grit and is on his way to meet the newly registered hunters. Sangwoo then completes the hunter exam and is classified as an F rank, which is the starting point for any newly registered hunters. Despite the proctor being intimidating, he thinks that the exam is too easy and is barely any harder than a driver's license test. The writing exam was only 20 questions and was really understandable. The performance test was just a target practice, and they were given advantages. The last exam was the aptitude test, and he just compared it to an elementary school ethics class. After that, he thought that it was too easy for a job that risked lives and that the government was rushing to take them in but decided not to overthink it. As he was walking out of the hunter building exam, he saw a couple of recruiters who were trying to make the newly registered hunters join their agency. He was then approached by Jun Mo Kong who handed him his calling card in which he showed interest. Their conversation almost ended when Sang Wu's status window flashed across his face, showing that his cloning skill had leveled up and he could now summon two of his clones at the same time, which resulted in him running back to his home, without having a proper conversation with Jun Mo Kong, whom he left alone speechless outside of the building. Back to his apartment. Sangwoo was able to summon his clone number two and expected a lot of good things to happen from then on as he looked at the calling card that Junmo Kong gave him earlier. Junmo on the other hand then finishes up giving some of his calling cards and hoped that some of the hunters would call him back. He then remembered when he was still a member of the Haizan Guild. He was then tasked to make payments on a list given by his supervisor, 
he noticed that some of the prices weren't making any sense and immediately told his supervisor about it but the supervisor advised him to be quick-witted or else nothing would be left for them. He also told Junmo not to be too sensitive about the guild business. Junmo then receives a call from Sangwu who would like to ask some questions so they agreed to meet at a cafe. Sangwu liked to know about the hunting grounds that were safe and suitable for his level. Junmo then confirmed it and asked Sangwu about his skill to which he said cloning. Junmo thought it was an ordinary illusion clone that was pretty useless, but then proceeded to hand his contract and explained him the hunting grounds that are available to his skill level. He recommended the slime grounds which only needs some protective gear due to the slime's nature, and the horned rabbit's nest which is also good but needs some time to be familiar with since you have to shoot it from a distance, and they are quite difficult to catch but safe. Sangwu liked the contract and proceeded to agree to the terms Junmo gave. Junmo asked which of the two hunting grounds would Sangwu like to go to first, and as Sangwu said both, he revealed his clone that surprised Junmo. As Sangwu stated he meant to hunt at both places at the same time. Junmo had a flashback from an interview with a hunter who had a similar skill but the difference is its clones are only illusions and cannot do anything physical. However, after looking at what Sangwu is demonstrating in front of him, he even thinks that they are twins but Sangwu explains to him that it is not an illusion clone and he has actual substance. He also informs him that he has another clone who is at the gym right now explaining some of it perks that he gains from doing so. Junmo thought that it was not just a basic skill and that there was a lot of potential in what Sangwu could do as a hunter. Sangwu then asks him about being able to be at two hunting grounds at the same time. Junmo said that there could be problems, but he will be able to talk to the hunter association to get it sorted out, and that he might undergo another bracelet scan and skill demonstration. Sangwu agreed but due to the cooldown of his skill, they both decided to do it two days from now. As for the contract signing, Junmo confirmed that it was already signed and showed great happiness, and eagerness for a bright future in working together. Two days later at the hunter association building outside, Sangwu seemed to be a little anxious but went early as he was also greeted by Junmo. The inside of the building is huge and is full of hunters who are inquiring left and right. As they approached one of the workers there, they immediately informed the worker regarding his request to be able to be at both hunting grounds at the same time. The worker said Sangwu was the first to ask for it since, Jumper. After working on relevant applications on Sangwu's request, the worker gave him a huge pile of documents to be filled out which made Sangwu surprised. But Junmo said he would be handling it, and that Sangwu should be in the demonstration room to receive a suitability evaluation. Sangwu then goes over to the demonstration room to show his skills to the proctors. Despite some embarrassing moments, he is still able to make a good impression and is provided with new authorization for his clones together with an ID bracelet like his. Considering the nature of cloning it was made possible that he would be able to enter separate hunting grounds and for his clones to enter the same one after him. The mechanic even said that his skill could be a breakthrough not just in Korea but for the whole world as well but Sangwoo brushes it off and leaves, leaving the mechanic bummed out. After that he meets with Junmo after finishing the application, with Sangwoo planning to go immediately hunting. Junmo asks why his clone is wearing a mask but Sangwoo replies that it is discomforting that people are showing too much interest in his skill. While they were conversing, an individual took notice of them on one of the higher floors. It was Haesung Shin, Haesung's guild master, the number one guild in Korea. Haesung calls out for Junmo, leaps from the upper floor, and then lands where Sangwoo and Junmo are standing. He then greets Junmo with a menacing look and tone of voice. Sangwoo on the other hand is aware of who Haizang is. Junmo then greets him politely but Haizang laughs it off and tells him that they are old buddies. He then looks at Sangwoo with intimidation and asks who he is. Junmo says that he is a hunter associated with his company. Haizang then proceeds to mock both Sangwoo and Junmo due to Sangwoo's rank and Junmo's sudden deterioration in his line of work since he used to work with C and B ranked hunters while laughing. Junmo got angry and was about to confront Haesung but he was stopped by Sangwoo. Haesung then intimidated Sangwoo but Sangwoo smiled and appreciated his presence by meeting him, the number one guild master. Haesung compliments Sangwoo on his knowledge but then Sangwoo continues to say that his guild is number one, in Monopoly and Dungeons, its control over hunting grounds, and other irritating statements that annoyed Haesung. Haizang was surprised by his courage and suddenly appeared behind Sangwoo questioning him if he could back up his words. 
but as he was about to make his move, his employee rushed over and called him, making him stop and return to the business he should be doing. He then asked for Sangwoo's name but Sangwoo said he should find out for himself. Haizang laughs it off and parted ways with them both. As Junmo drives Sangwoo and clone number one to the hunting grounds, he thanks Sangwoo for earlier. Sangwoo says that he just couldn't stand back and do nothing. Junmo asks if Sangwoo knows his history with the Haizan Guild which Sangwoo confirms and tells him he looked into everything before signing the contract. There was not much information online but he found that Junmo was dismissed from Haizan for whistleblowing. Due to this, people are scared of joining his agency due to the Haizan Guild's power. Junmo asks why Sangwoo still joined. Sangwoo makes a smug face saying that it's because his portion of the profit is amazing. And besides, he figured he could trust someone who would leave a guild because they couldn't bear the corruption. Junmo was held back to his statement and thanked Sangwoo. Meanwhile, one of Sangwoo's clone is in the middle of exercise in the gym and the people around him is concerned since he has been training hard too much without asking for help. He then receives a text from Sangwoo instructing him to stop working out wash up, and meet him in front of the gym by four, which he immediately does, making the gym facilitator relieved. In the slime hunting grounds, Sangwoo had just finished trying it out. Junmo asks him how it goes and Sangwoo tells him how quite difficult it is due to the nature of the slime since he emits toxic gas after getting killed. Sangwoo is also not lenient about the equipment durability, since getting a better one would mean paying more than earning. He suddenly then introduced clone number two to do the job for him since he has already experienced it himself. He then puts the hunting gear to clone number two and tells him that he got this as Junmo looks at him nervously. After clone number two goes in, Sangwoo tells Junmo that they should head to the horned rabbit hunting grounds. Sangwoo then turns to look at clone number one but then he remembers that he should have picked him up at the gym earlier but completely forgot about it. Clone number one on the other hand is still waiting outside the gym shaking from the exercise. Sangwoo then picks up clone number one with Junmo. Junmo then asks Sangwoo why he calls them by numbers and not names. Sangwoo then tells him that since they all looked alike it doesn't make any sense and would just cause confusion which Junmo agrees. Sangwoo then talked about the horned rabbit hunting grounds needing guns to hunt. He should be needing to bring his own equipment. Junmo confirms it but also informs him that there is decent equipment that's also available at the hunting ground itself. He still recommended Sangwoo to buy his own equipment, since the equipment available could only be used in the hunting ground. They suddenly heard gunshots meaning that they had arrived at the location, Eugenson Field. The location is almost like a huge military facility or base camp with all the soldiers patrolling since the place was famed for the monster break that occurred there. Usually, portals are cut off from the outside world that's why most hunts are conducted by hunters from within portals. However, sometimes monsters cross these portals and cause terror as locations near these portals suddenly turn into a battlefield, which is also known as Monster Break. Most of the high-level monsters were already dealt with five years ago at the time of the break. Now most of the spots are F and E rank friendly. They went to one of the equipment rentals there. All the equipment Sangwoo needed cost around 700,000 won, as it left him trembling with the price. Junmo then said that it is really the case but it won't seem bad if he can catch a bunch of them since one horned rabbit is equivalent to one whole tank of slime. After that, all three of them went to the designated hunting area. Upon entering they were greeted by the sound of gunshots and other hunters collecting horned rabbits as Sangwoo prepared. Junmo asked if he was good with a gun to which Sangwoo replied confidently that he only missed three times in the hunter qualification shooting test. He then prepares and then aims at the first horned rabbit he sees and shoots. Three hours passed, and Sangwoo lost all confidence since he had not hit anything nor captured one since then, since the horned rabbits always scampered off the moment he was about to shoot, even Junmo left after waiting for him to catch one. Losing hope, he then instructed clone number one to kill and catch a rabbit, then told him to text him. One, every time he got one and call him once he ran out of bullets then went home with a disappointed look. Sangwoo then looks at his stats and sees that clone number two is doing a good job as per seeing that his magic stat is increasing. He also noticed that he keeps on leveling up but is still nowhere near where he needs to be when he remembered about the situation with Haizang earlier. He still can't believe that the horned rabbits were hard to catch and hoped clone number one would at least catch one. While Sangwoo sleeps, 
His phone continuously rings from the sudden messages from clone number one. Junmo received a call from the manager of the slime hunting grounds asking him to stop his hunter, as he had already been in the field for twenty-four hours, and they thought that something was wrong with him. Junmo then immediately proceeds to the area as Sangwoo wakes up from his bed. Upon checking his phone, he sees a missed call meaning that clone number one already has run out of bullets and Sangwoo is shocked at what he saw. Junmo, on the other hand, was surprised that clone number two was able to fill eight whole slime tanks in one day as the portal guards tried to stop clone number two from going back in. Junmo then calls Sangwo and tells him what happened and that he is calling the monster corpse collectors and he can tell clone number two to stop now. Sangwo responds positively, and also asks Junmo to do the same thing to clone number one at Yujangsen since he thinks that the whole situation is almost the same there with clone number one killing a ton of horned rabbits. The people at Yujangsen are crowding over clone number one as they look upon a mountain of dead horned rabbits. He is then approached by a sales team leader of a guild who also hands out his business card but there is no response from clone number one. The agent was furious but he was told by other major guild agents who already tried talking to clone number one earlier that it was no use. Sangwu then went in and handed clone number one more ammunition, instructed him to hand over the corpses to Junmo and praised him. Clone number one was happy with the praise as he loads up the rifle to hunt again. People swarmed around clone number one as Sangwoo slips away from the crowd. Sangwoo rethinks his clone's capabilities due to the fact that even if only half of his stats are given to them, their ability far surpasses what he has expected and they perform like machines, with no hesitation, fully focused. He was then startled by Heian, as they were in the middle of private tutoring. He apologized and Heian asked him what he was thinking. He mentioned his last hunt and Heian was surprised to find out that Sangwoo was a hunter. Sangwoo was humble about it but then Heian asked him if he knew this now famous hunter called Yu Jangsen's Eagle Eye. Then she showed him a video of clone number one getting interviewed. Sangwoo was surprised and nervous. Heian thinks he is cool and her actual dream is to be a hunter herself. Sangwoo asks if she is already awakened and she confirms it. She also passed the hunter's exam already but finds herself scared of going to the hunting ground. She requested that Sangwu take her there if she passed her exams to which Sangwu agreed. Heian was very happy as they both made a promise to make it happen. After their tutoring was over, Mrs. Jang asked Sangwu how she was doing and Sangwu praised her which made Mrs. Jang surprised. She then offered him dinner but Sangwu needed to be elsewhere and respectfully declined. As Sangwu left, Heian jumped around her room with joy as she talked to her teddy bear. She was happy that she got a date with Sangwu. She initially disliked the tutoring idea as it was someone his dad knew, but after being under Sangwoo's supervision, she found Sangwoo kind and good-looking. Thankful for what happened she then motivates herself to get back to studying. Sangwoo went to Yujangsen's hunting grounds and met with Junmo to collect monster corpses that were killed by clone number one. Junmo stated that he needed to call collection teams from all sorts of hunting grounds due to the number of horned rabbits that clone number one collected with a count of 352 in total it was the most that they collected in one go. Sangwoo was then informed by Junmo that his earnings were sent in already. Sangwoo's jaw dropped at the money that he earned saying that it could be too much but Junmo explained that he paid him at a rate of an E-rank hunter due to the skill his clones showed, in which Sangwoo was thankful yet thinks he is still not there. Suddenly they were approached by another hunter who was angry claiming that clone number one stole all of the horned rabbits that he was supposed to hunt and demanded compensation. Sangwoo and Junmo were surprised but were still calm as the hunter demanded at least 10% commission on the earnings. Sangwoo burst out laughing which annoyed the hunter as Sangwoo then told that clone number one wouldn't be here for a while due to his recent hunt. As they attempted to leave, the hunter tried to stop them but was then ignored Sangwoo and Junmo. The hunter attacked in anger. Sangwoo then calls clone number one who takes the punch sending him flying, which is then recorded by Sangwoo on his phone, saying that this could cause a ruckus if people find out there was violence on the hunting ground. The move made the hunter terrified of the idea as Sangwoo told him with a grim look on his face that they were leaving now, making the hunter furious but helpless. Junmo tells Sangwoo that the hunter who tried to swindle them was a member sent by the Haizang guild due to Junmo's past with the guild. Junmo noticed it already as he was on the phone with the collection team and the hunter was there watching him the moment they started the collection. He assumed it was Haizang's way of getting back at him. 
Junmo stated that it is nothing new for the hunters he recruited to face these problems, and as embarrassing as it sounds, it is also the reason why they leave his agency with only Sangwu and a few other F-rank hunters that are left. Sangwu being aware of all the danger assures Junmo that everything will be okay and that they can't let Haizang mess with them anymore, and that is why Sangwu is thinking of a way to get stronger faster. He then explained his plans to Junmo. Junmo was interested, and they agreed to meet at the hunter market tomorrow at 2 p.m. The hunter market already speaks for what it offers, from trading weapons, armor, and equipment that replaced hunter-to-hunter -hunter trades that hold an unrivaled position in the industry, and their giant building has a lot to offer to hunters that go there. Junmo goes with Sangwu to buy new armor sets which is a light armor type made from titanium alloy that is guaranteed to protect him from E-rank monster attacks which Sangwoo really likes and also prefers a gun and a knife as his weapon, he then orders a set of three of that armor and weapons. They also proceeded to look for the familiar skill ball which shares the sense and the visions of the owner's familiar, summons, and pets. However, Sangwoo was shocked at the price of the skill and then asked Junmo for an advance. Junmo was quite hesitant but still sent the amount as Sangwoo stated that if things went to plan, it would eventually pay itself in no time. Sangwu headed back to his place with all the items he had bought from the hunter market. He followed the instructions on the manual of the familiar skill ball in order to activate it. After confirming that the skill had been added, he called both of the clones who were also wearing their new set of armor and weapons he bought earlier. In their conversation yesterday Sangwu shared information about his clones, revealing that they only possessed half of his stats. However, he noted that one of his clones had successfully captured over 300 horn rabbits, highlighting his clone's skill and abilities. He also mentioned the incident in which he had instructed his clone to act as if they were hit by a hunter's punch and to overreact dramatically. Sangwoo acknowledged that perfectly timing such actions and fearlessly allowing his clone to get hit by the punch was not an easy task, but it demonstrated the clone's capabilities. Sangwoo further speculated that his clone could have beaten the hunter if it wanted to, suggesting that the clone that even though their stats are low, the clones possess incredible control over their bodies and Sangwoo wants to take advantage of it using the familiar skill. His plan involves that the clones be in two locations at the same time, one for close-quarter combat and one for long-range weapons. To be most effective, he plans to push the clones to their limits. He could feel what they were experiencing with the use of familiar skill. The two clones showed great skill which surprised the facilitators of the training grounds they went into. Sangwoo on the other hand was in another location as he activated the familiar skill. He went first to his clone at the close quarter combat training and sensed everything during the clone's sparring session. After that, he used the familiar skill at his clone at the shooting range and did the same approach earlier, getting the hang of things and how his clone was doing their designated tasks, copying every move he could as he made his own. As Sangwu absorbs all of the skills and body movements that his clones have experienced in both of their respective training, his status window informs him that his strength and reflexes have increased as well. He then decides to go back and forth between his two clones to maximize his newly acquired skill. He starts with his clone that is in the close quarter combat gym, which is now facing the gym's manager who is probably the strongest in the area. They exchanged blows as the manager saw that his offense is still not polished but his defense was perfect with the way that he evaded his attack. They continued to attack each other with all of their strength as Sangwa's clone mirrored the manager's attack which he noticed immediately. The manager then swipes high but was dodged by the clone and was able to counter hit the manager by the shoulders cornering him into a wall. As Sangwa was about to deliver the final blow, the manager suddenly uses the wall to his advantage to launch himself up in the air for a surprise counter-attack and disarms the clone that Sangwoo looking into using his familiar skill. Sangwoo also felt the pain in his wrist from the manager's attack. The manager told him it was a close call and asked if he wanted to continue. Sangwoo asked number one if he was fine, but he copied the move earlier which surprised everyone even Sangwoo himself. After doing so, his clone raised his head and asked for another round. The gym manager was delighted to do so. Sangwoo then switched to number two that is on the shooting range. As he was speechless that his clone was so accurate, he was even hitting the clay targets of a man who was trying to impress his girlfriend nearby, thinking he was the one hitting the targets, but it's the clone's doing. Sangwoo then absorbs how his clone takes aim during target hitting, 
with the postures and the prediction of where the target will be at a certain point, and remembers all the other fundamentals of shooting, taking in what his clones have. Sangwu then goes back to his body after using the skill, he suddenly feels dizzy due to using too much mana and decides to rest for a while. He was amazed by his clone's lack of hesitation and fear, thinking that next time he himself should go with his clones on training. Sangwu was greeted by Heian who seemed to be on her way home from the library. As they were conversing, some people were watching them, who planned to get back at Sangwu. It was the hunter at Yujangsen who tried to swindle them. Only this time he's with a couple of people. Earlier, the hunter whom Sangwu confronted at Yujangsen was scolded by someone over the phone for not being able to do something to them the last time they met, and was told not to go near Yujangsen and denied being a member of the Haizang Guild, leaving him furious as he throws his phone away but was then called by his friend Gyunsiak which is a lone shark. The hunter told him what happened, as he was about to offer him some collecting gigs, the hunter saw Sangwu together with Heian near their location. He points to them and confirms to Gyunsak that it was the person who took the video, Gyunsiak, and the hunter together with another person then confronts Sangwu who notices the hunter behind Gyunsiak. He calls for his clones and then asks what they want from them. The hunter was about to jump and attack but was calmed down by Gyunsiak who then tells Sangwu that he should delete the video and they can go away unharmed. Sangwu reconfirms the terms but Gyunsiak calls it out and will still harm him anyway. Sangwu tells Heian to run away when she sees the chance as he prepares to fight. Gyunsiak calls to attack as the hunter, and one of his lackeys rush to Sangwu who tries to dodge some of the attacks but is still hit and falls into the ground. Heian tried to intervene by displaying her ability which startled the two who attacked Sangwu. Gyunsiak then told the two to not be afraid of a high schooler and decided to come in himself. Heian attacks him with the orb of light. His two assistants are shocked at first but he takes no damage despite the attack and is about to hit Heian. Sangwu steps in and is able to block the hit and lands a counterpunch to the face of Gyunsiak. Sangwu immediately remembered the training earlier as the hunter went in to attack him which he dodged with ease and was able to easily land a counterattack on his face. Gyunsiak's lackey followed with an attack. Sangwu decided to exchange blows Gyunsiak's lackey to fall to the ground because of the hit. Gyunsiak was able to recover and even smiled at the opportunity of being able to go full force due to Sangwu's skills. Sangwu was still reeling from the damage from earlier and assumed Gyunsiak had a strength enhancement skill. Gyunsiak rushes in to attack Sangwu but Sangwu is able to dodge the punch and land a counter hit again and continues doing so landing heavy hits to Gyunsiak who is having a hard time landing a hit on Sangwu. Sangwu was too agile, dodging left and right. Gyunsiak's body started to spark as he charged up a powerful blow which Sangwu was trying to anticipate but his feet were grabbed by Gyunsiak's lackey which caught him off guard. Gyunsiak lands the attack on Sangwu's body sending him flying. Sangwu struggled to breathe due to the attack. Gyunsiak was about to land the final hit when Heian used her magic to attack Gyunsiak and assist Sangwu. Gyunsiak's lackeys rushed to Heian but were stopped by clones number one and two upon their arrival at the scene. Sangwu was able to recover due to this as Gyunsiak then charged at Sangwu who displayed the skill he copied from the gym manager landing the final blow and knocking out Gyunsiak. Sangwu's stats increased such as his strength, reflex, stamina, and endurance, and because of the intensity of the fight, Sangwu's cloning skill has leveled up and he can now summon three clones, and its passive skills have leveled up as well, he laughed before laying down, exhausted. Later, Sangwu is taking Heian home. He asks why didn't he and run earlier but she answers jokingly, to which Sangwu somehow agrees but still insists that it was dangerous. He and also could not believe that his clone was Yu Jiangsen's eagle eye but Sangwu hoped that she would not go around telling everyone since it might cause some problems like the one they encountered earlier. He and agreed as they arrived at her apartment. Sangwu confirmed again if Heian was okay and she told him to not worry about it and suggested he should give her less homework but Sangwu knew that she already completed it a while ago. Sangwu then thanks Heian once again for her help earlier and she tells Sangwu to just treat her to dinner. Sangwu agrees and will try to find a day that could fit both of their schedules to which Heian is delighted. Sangwu then asks his clones why they are still following him and that they should be working out. His clones inform him that all the training facilities have already closed. He then picks up a couple of sticks of tree branches and tells both of his clones to train in the park. 
One month has passed and Sangwa's improvement is going pretty well. Junmo asks him over the phone about their plan's progress so far and it seems to be positive and is increasing rapidly. Looking at his stats, Sangwu thinks that he is on an E-ranker's level as he asks Junmo to arrange three F-rank hunting grounds by tomorrow. He was taken aback by the request but assures Sangwu that he can make it happen and asks the time of the hunt. After they agree on the schedule, Sangwu assembles his clones as he commands them to specific areas to exercise and tells them to go work out in the park and come back at 12 and leave the guns. As Sangwu browses the internet to watch hunter videos, he thinks about how his clones are fast learners and how they are able to copy movements easily. He wonders what happens if he studies all the monsters and ways to hunt them correctly. He assumes his clones would also improve this way. Time passed and the clones were back from training, which Sangwu did not even notice due to studying the attack patterns of the monsters they would most likely encounter during a hunt. He then plans to learn mana breathing as his clones would do the hunting at the same time. After that, he commands them to prepare after eating as Junmo is coming to pick them up and take them to their designated hunting grounds. Junmo arrives and feels the presence of the clones is a little overpowering to which Sangwu agrees. He then asks if the hunting grounds are prepared which Junmo confirms as his clones get into the car with Junmo. He then asks Sangwu if he's not going to which he confirms, telling him that he will be at home as he will be learning mana breathing and just inform him once all of the clones are on their designated hunting grounds. After Junmo leaves, Sangwu immediately tries to follow the steps he learned in order to execute mana breathing, focusing on breathing techniques and body relaxation. He continuously feels the mana circulating around his body. Upon doing this he feels the sudden surge of energy in his chest, and his status window suddenly appears, informing him that the skill, meditation, has been obtained. The skill he acquired stabilizes his mind and increases his mana recovery. In one of the dungeons, many hunters had fallen while a hunter crawls for his life after losing one of his legs, scared of what he sees and surprised that one of those powerful monsters appears at a supposed to be a safe hunting ground, he tried to escape but the monster that lurks around him already had his sights on him and quickly finishes him off. Junmo arrives at the same dungeon together with the designated clone. He informs him of the monsters inside. He then texts Sangwu that he has delivered all three and sees the potential in what Sangwu could do to cause quite a stir in the hunting business. Meanwhile, Sangwu thought that he was able to unlock the mana breathing skill but realized the meditation skill is different as stated by the guide which made him quite disappointed. After receiving the text from Genmo, he instantly casts the familiar skill on number one, who is currently hunting giant rats, a F-rank monster, and found he seemed to be doing well. Sangwu confirms that he had learned all that he could about this type of monster. The clone then applied the guide video of how to deal with giant rats and proceeded to execute all of the instructions that were given by the video that Sangwu had watched earlier, with precision and accuracy. Sangwu confirms that the strategies he has learned can be applied to combat by his clones during hunts. Despite how dire some situations can be during hunts, the clones execute them without fear and hesitation, and at the same time, Sangwu learns to hunt from a distance using his familiar skill as his stats increase at a rapid rate due to his clones being in three hunting grounds at the same time. In the giant rats hunting grounds, some hunters are confused that the dungeon sounds quieter than usual and that they should have encountered monsters already. They then see a pile of giant rat corpses and assume they hit the jackpot. On the other hand, as Sangwu overlooks all the hunts that seem to be going well, he feels that something is missing and immediately realizes that he forgot to instruct his clones to gather the corpses. He then commands them to do so and don't hunt until it's completed. He notices clone number three isn't picking up some corpses and asks him why. Clone number three says that he is not the one who hunted it. He then tells clone number three to collect it even if it's not theirs but notices that some of the corpses are severely damaged. Clone number three then picks up a human's arm which startled Sangwu. Suddenly, something moved fast which they both noticed. They heard something, and when clone number three turned around to react, only to find out it was only a bait. The monster appeared behind them, tearing clone number three's arm which caused Sangwu to subconsciously disconnect from the familiar skill due to the severe pain. He collects himself, then calls Junmo informing him of what happened, and requests to take clone number one and two to the sewage plant immediately. Meanwhile, Clone number three eventually disperses due to the damage he receives. 
Sang Wu arrived at the location and verified himself to the guards when suddenly he felt disconnected from Clone 3. After finding Junlo inside who was already with Clone 1 and 2, Sang Wu informed him that Number 3 was taken out not by a two-legged fish but something way stronger. Junmo asks for the description and after Sangwu describes what he saw, Junmo is shocked and tells him that the dungeons should be closed temporarily and alert security, telling Junmo that the monster is a fishman, a D-rank monster that is really deadly to the ranks of Sangwu that even a party of E-rankers don't stand chance against it. Sangwu is aware of what could happen but tells Junmo to delay the report until his clones get inside the portal, and requests Junmo to trust him and his clones. He then activates his familiar skill into one of his clones inside the dungeon as they head to where clone number three is killed. Both clones approached cautiously and immediately spotted the fishman who was eating two-legged fish. Sangwu then assesses the situation and thinks that he has a chance, looking at what he can do and the fishman's condition which is pretty damaged from the battles it went through before him. He then commands his clones to aim for the head. Both clones started shooting but the bullets just bounced off the fishman's skin like it was made of rubber. They were noticed by the now enraged fishman. It leaped above the clones and tried to attack them but it was then countered by one of the clones with a long sword attack but it barely scratched the skin of the fishman. They tried to lure him into the trees to limit its movement but it did not work. Both clones attacked at the same time but there was no damage and one of them took a hit and flew into a tree. Sangwu was confused but was able to find a weak spot thanks to one of the bullets that went through the fisherman's skin and ordered his clones to shoot into it. Sangwu was glad it worked and continued to attack. Suddenly the fisherman's blood dripped through the sword that it was holding and it started to emit flame. The fisherman also suddenly became stronger. One of the clones was hit with its swing and felt the sudden increase in damage and noticed that the sword was reacting to its blood. Sangwu analyzes the moment as they exchange a flurry of blows and slices, and until one of his clones is stabbed in the abdomen, but he holds onto the arms of the fishman to make sure that his counterattack will land, he successfully landed a flurry of attacks. The fishman endured the attack and tried to land a hit on one of the clones, but the other clone blocks and continued to exchange blows with the fishman. Eventually, they finally knocked the fishman down. Both of his clones also fell to the ground due to exhaustion but the sight of relief was not over, as they looked that the fishman was gone, as footsteps with blood were the only traces left. Sangwu then commands Clone 2 to follow it. As Clone 1 cannot move due to injuries, Sangwu then notices that the fishman is heading in the direction of the portal. Outside the portal, hunters are stopped by the soldiers and informed of the situation. Junmo is also there and hopes that Sangwu can finish the hunt in time. The soldiers in the portal were stunned seeing the fishman running towards the portal. They opened fire hoping it would go down but the bullets were of no use. Suddenly Clone 2 emerged from the bushes and threw out a knife that bounced off the fishman's head it was then caught by Sangwu himself who dealt the final blow by plunging the knife onto its head with all of his strength, shocking everyone and Clone 2 approves. After the encounter, one of the agents that were sent to deal with the fishman arrives at the hunting grounds and the first thing he sees is the corpse of the fishman itself at the portal entrance. He asks one of the guards who informs the man of what happened and cannot believe the information he received that an F-ranker was able to kill a D-rank monster even noticing that the damage was focused on pre-existing wounds. Nevertheless, he still did a routine check inside the dungeon to see if it was clear and safe again but is still undecided on what to report to the association. Sangwu, on the other hand, has unlocked regeneration which is a special stat, he also gained sprinting and shooting skills. His stats have also increased exponentially due to the encounter, he also unlocked another skill which is, smite, which enables full power attacks. Junmo then asks how his clones are and Sangwu explains they are fine but since the cloning skill is on cooldown it would take some time before he could summon them again it is also a chance to naturally upgrade regeneration by letting them heal themselves. Junmo then expressed how incredible Sangwu is and is considering him to move up to E rank after seeing his improvement. Sangwu stated that he needs some time to study what monsters to encounter first at E rank dungeons and remembers the sword that the fishman was using. He was about to pick it up, but Junmo stopped him and said that it could be cursed, and that cursed items are classified as rare and valuable, which made Sangwu really happy. Sangwu decided to let his clones use it. He then showed a jewel in hopes he would find value in it but Junmo said it's pretty much worthless. 
It increased his stats but it wasn't usable on a person because of the severe side effects. He added that his other loots are much better as a form of consoling him. Sangwu goes back to his apartment with his two other clones who are injured and commands them to take a rest while he then resummons clone number three and proceeds to send him to work out. He then takes out the jewel and the sword that he had looted from the dungeon encounter. He searched about the jewel and found it's a strength jewel which increases strength but it cannot be used on a person the side effects is there is a chance the target becomes a monster when used excessively. He wonders if it would also affect him. He decides to put it aside for now and then proceeds to check the sword and commands clone number two to pick it up. Nothing particular happens but clone number two stated that he could hear a voice. Sang Wu tried to connect using the familiar skill and he heard very loud noises saying kill and give me blood from holding the dagger which surprised him. But it wasn't affecting clone number two so he decided to use the sword. His regeneration stat increased again and was planning on restarting the hunting cycle tomorrow, but considering the state of his clones he decided to train on meditation with his clones in order to learn mana breathing. Tomorrow, he has to go back to school. Sang was vacation ended up in a flash due to the things that have happened as he was just focused on leveling up. Looking at his increased stats he considered he had improved a lot and this was because of his clones not taking a rest. All of this seems useless to him at the moment because no one even greets him and realizes he is a loner. Upon entering the classroom, he is greeted by Jiangde who is in the same class because he heard the teacher gives good grades. All the other people in the room, especially the women, could not believe that it was Sangwoo due to weight loss and were attracted by his looks. He asked Jiangde how much he had changed. Jiangde replied that even his parents won't recognize him. Sangwoo also plans to go visit his parents soon. Jiangdu then asks Sangwoo to hang out with them to celebrate the start of the semester, but he refuses since he already made plans. Jiangdu makes a ruckus thinking Sangwoo is refusing because of a girl. His other friends also heard what he said and look at him with shock. At the WCHA or World Hunter Association headquarters, President Michael Harris has been informed by his secretary that the Oracle has predicted a disaster that there will be an invasion of hundreds of monsters due to the appearance of an unstable portal. It's also confirmed that the most dangerous monsters are A-ranked, and that the portal will open in the near future, and that the expected location is the Korean Peninsula. Back in South Korea, Park Day, the guild master of the Kinas, the third-ranked guild in Korea seems to be in a rush due to the sudden large summon when he bumps into Miho Han, his friend and the guild master of the Yalo Guild, the sixth-ranked guild in Korea. They caught up to each other and exchanged greetings and as they arrive in the meeting room, all the other head of top guilds are there and Wante was greeted by Haesong Shin, the guild master of the number one guild in Korea, Haesong. Miho expressed her disgust and Wante greeted him with a cold shoulder. Apparently, Haesong knew about the Odin's Tower incident that happened to Wante's top guild members and expressed curiosity about the issue. Ilgan Kim, the director of the Taeyang Guild which is number two in Korea, tried to stop the issue as Wante tries to hold his anger due to the continuous provocation of Shin Haesong. Suddenly the president of the Korean Hunter Association Bayan Hun O arrives at the room and notices what happened but still proceeds to start the meeting right away due to its importance. He thanks them for showing up and immediately tells them of the message from the World Hunter Association that an unstable portal will appear and will cause a massive invasion of monsters. There are no expected dates and locations of where it will appear exactly but the mission to have the guilds have to cover all of South Korea is a problem that they needed to discuss. There were a lot of problems that they could encounter because of this. Thankfully Park Wonhae had the idea of the respective guilds to prepare a group of hunters that could be dispatched immediately and patrol their nearby regions then only respond to the portal when it shows. And those who don't adhere will be punished greatly by the association in which everybody agrees. Thus the meeting was finished. Sangwoo was on his way back from school when he saw Heian getting asked out by a guy that is also asking for her number. Heian was reluctant stating she already had a boyfriend. She then saw Sangwoo and grabbed him by the arm, and called him, baby, while leaving. Which surprised Sangwoo. Heian clarifies that she just told the guy that she has a boyfriend and that she does not actually have a boyfriend for his information. He then asks Heian why is she not wearing a uniform and she explained that it's her school's anniversary, and then proceeds to tease Sangwoo of wanting to get her number which got Sangwoo pissed for a moment because he already has it. 
Sang Wu then receives a message from Junmo saying that his initial advance has already been paid and that the remainder has already been deposited in his account. He is happy and invites He Yin to a meal. As they eat, He Yin is worried seeing the food prices, but Sang Wu brushes it off and tells her to eat to her fullest since he feels bad for her injured hand. Suddenly, everyone receives an alert. It is also shown on television. An emergency warning airs all throughout Korea with a message saying that monsters may invade through an unstable portal and that the affected area is the whole country as all citizens are advised to evacuate and head to local shelters and prepare. Meanwhile, jiang Du complains about how Sang-woo is now possibly on a date with a girl. One of them suggested not to jump to conclusions until he saw Sang-woo with Hei-in eating at the restaurant which angered him. They also received a warning message as well with jiang Du worrying about the seriousness of the situation. Sang-woo and Hei-in came out and saw jiang Du and his friends asking them why they were there. They asked if Hei-in was his girlfriend which made her blush but Sang-woo explained that he tutored her and that she is his student. After they exchanged greetings, Sang Wu gave the meat leftovers to Hian so that she could share it with her parents, and advised her to head straight home. That made his friends look at him like an actual teacher. He shouted at them all telling them to go home. He then noticed that the people around him were just acting as if there was no warning from the Hunter Association earlier. He called Junmo to ask about what he knew about the announcement and Junmo told that they were unsure when the portal is going to show up and the monsters invading would be quite dangerous as even A-class monsters were expected. Sangwu was disturbed by how little to no information was given on the announcement earlier and was worried about what would happen to his family, as they both agreed to go home first and prepare for what could come. Back in Sangwu's apartment, clones number one and two were still recovering while doing mana breathing but clone number one's injury was severe so he decided to resummon him. He then gathered all of the clones, as they headed, to go home to his family. Looking back, it's been three months since Sangwu visited his family, as he enters their home, and immediately greets his mom, who didn't recognize him at first, even his dad, but his sister really could not believe it was her brother. His mom then asks about the people he is with. Sangwu introduces his clones to them, his entire family is shocked as he explains who they are. He then explained that it was his awakening skill that he got from the program, and her sister wishes to do it as well. Then his father asks if he works as a hunter too, which Sangwu confirms but her mother expresses her worry. Sangwu assured her that his clones do all the hunting. He proceeded to talk about getting them all to the shelter due to the announcement. His dad wanted to observe the situation first as he still had to go to work tomorrow. Knowing that he couldn't convince them Sangwu decided to stay with them and stated he did not have classes which is a lie. After their discussion, he brought out his share of leftovers from the barbecue place so they could eat together. Her mom thought of also including the clones, but he said they only needed rice since it's not worth it to give them meals. As they ate, his mom realized that it had been a while since they had been together for dinner. Suddenly, an explosion took place near their apartment and everything went dark until Sangwu gained consciousness and saw the destruction in front of him. It was the portal outbreak and it happened to be at their location. With all the different types of monsters surging out from it, a huge dragon shows up and breathes fire immediately, causing havoc in the nearby buildings. He then rushes to wake up his family who had fallen unconscious. He noticed clone number one's gear on the floor and realized that he shielded them from the explosion with his body. Clones number two and number three emerge from the rubble with number three severely injured. His also regains consciousness. Sangwu immediately tells them to go to the shelter. Below them is pure chaos as monsters are all over the place attacking everyone. Sangwu and his family prepare to head out. He then gives clone number one's armor to his sister for protection, when a monster suddenly falls from the sky in front of them. Sangwu thought some portals appeared in the sky and some monsters that couldn't fly fell to their death. While Sangwu finishes off the other monsters, his sister and father try to open the door but it is jammed. Sangwu asks to borrow the baseball bat and uses power strike on the door, destroying the lock and kicking the door open. Sangwu led his family outside and saw the destruction everywhere. His father informs him that the nearest shelter is two kilometers away when suddenly various monsters spawned that seemed unbothered by the fall from the portals. His sister then suggested they use the underground tunnel as there is also a temporary shelter there. Sangwu suddenly heard a scream asking for help. 
The man was buried by the rubble, and on top was a D-rank monster which was a troll. His father reminded him that they were not in a position where they could help someone and persuaded Sang Wu to go inside. Sang Wu thinks about the situation and is having a hard time deciding, but his role as a hunter takes over and instructs his family to go inside the shelter as he commands clone number two to follow him and clone number three to protect his family. His family is against this idea but Sang Wu continued stating he is a hunter. Sang Wu attacks the troll with the baseball bat taking its attention so clone number two can take the stranded person to safety. As sang -woo taunted the troll, a monster nearby was watching and copied what he said. After clone number two saves the civilian, sang -woo orders him to take out the cursed sword and makes it consume the jewel that he looted from the fisherman corpse before. To ensure their chances of defeating the monster, clone number two consumes the jewel and immediately undergoes a transformation to a creature with red skin and yellow eyes. Sangwu confirms that he is still under his commands. The troll was surprised by the clone's transformation, and the sudden stat increase from the jewel was also given to Sangwu without the side effects. The troll started to attack, swinging the huge club and flinging debris towards Sangwu, but he dodged and blocked most of it. The troll tried to grab Sangwu, but clone number two attacked with the cursed sword and sliced one of its arms with ease, which surprised Sangwu. The troll screamed in pain and was enraged attacking clone two. Sangwu noticed it was slower than the fishman and made his move to attack but the trolls block with the arm that was cut off earlier, surprising Sangwu who was pushed back. He realized that it has a strong regeneration ability. Clone two was still attacking but the troll was just healing the damage almost instantly. Sangwu assessed the situation and commanded clone two to bring down the troll. Clone two attacked the legs bringing it to its knees. Sangwu then shoots its eyes blinding for a while. Clone 2 inflicts damage and as it stumbles to the ground and regains its sight, Sangwu is already preparing for an attack, then uses the power strike which instantly kills it. Sangwu gained a lot of strength stat due to killing the monster but feels the side effects of using power strike but thinks it was worth it. He decides to follow his family to the shelter but notices that his phone is missing and asks Clone 2 for his phone. Sangwu realizes Clone 2 might get chased out of the shelter due to his appearance. Suddenly they saw civilians who were running away from the other monsters and Sangwu cursed. Meanwhile, the huge dragon that appeared earlier gets targeted by hunters from various guilds. Almost all other high-ranking guilds have their eyes set on the huge monster, considering the profits and items they could get as they rally to bring the monster down. A jet suddenly arrives at the location. It is from Kinas Guild and its leader Park Wante. Park Wante and his guild Kynas prepares to drop into the battlefield, as he is informed that the Megalosaurus is getting far away. Seeing that multiple guilds are already targeting the Megalosaurus, Wante commanded all of his guild members to focus on rescuing and evacuating the citizens. Wante sees that some hunters are prioritizing looting and even taking items from dead civilians which makes him furious but notices a group of civilians that is being protected by only two hunters as he proceeds to their location and instructs the members to follow their plan, he then jumps from the jet. Sangwu is dealing with goblin-like monsters together with Clone 2 while also protecting civilians behind him. As he tries to make a way for the civilians to run to the shelter, a giant bird emerges from the rubble and tries to attack Sangwu. He is able to evade but it was followed by another attack by breathing fire into the area. Clone 2 blocks the attack with his body in order to protect the civilians, but it cost him his life. A giant tiger steps onto the bird in front of Sangwu. Its presence is too strong, and even the other monsters are scared. As it attempts to attack the exhausted Sangwu, one arrived instantly killing it in one attack. Sangwu recognized the man as the giant tiger behind him fell down. Meanwhile, inside the shelter, Sangwu's sister Jaiwu wanted to go out to help her brother but Clone 3 stopped her, following Sangwu's command. Her father stopped her, and stated she would only be a hindrance to his brother. They suddenly heard someone from outside the door, a person asking for help they thought it was from a different apartment, since shelters have passcodes to open the door, and the camera outside showed it was a person as well. They thought it was the person Sangwu saved earlier. Jaiwu rushes to open the door and sees the corpse of a person, being used as bait by a monster who copies human voices. It's a B-rank monster called Scream Firefly. People inside the shelter ran. As Jaiwa was frozen in fear, Clone 3 then rushed to attack the Firefly but was stabbed in the stomach, 
Unfortunately, the attack pierced Clone 3 also hitting Jaiwa. Clone 3 then destroys the shelter Pasco to initiate its emergency lockdown and pushes the monster outside of the shelter. Meanwhile, one day helps sang who thanks him for saving them. One day apologizes and praises sang for protecting all these people as he could have run away if he wanted to. One day also noticed the disappearance of clone number two earlier and was intrigued by how it happened. He then asked if sang was a hunter which he confirmed. One day asks what his skill is. sang is a bit hesitant but decides to tell him when suddenly he feels that clone three lost connection with him. Sang Wu rushes to the shelter taking the cursed sword with him and tells Wante that his family is in danger. Sang Wu feels the curse of the sword and uses sprint to increase his speed. In another area, the other guilds are having a tough time bringing down the Megalosaurus as its defense is too high that most of their attacks have little to no damage and most of them are already killed in battle. With the city sustaining more damage than before, other guilds decided to join forces in their attacks. Hai Zhang Shin suddenly shows up in front of them surprising everyone, he does not see the Megalosaurus as a monster but as a lump of cash. He demonstrates pure power to other hunters by casting meteors above the monster. Meanwhile, Jaiwa was being treated by his mother and father when the shelter doors were destroyed by the monster. Everyone inside the shelter panicked as sang showed up from behind, catching up to the monster. His eyes were red due to the cursed sword. He sees his sister lying on the ground with their parents. He goes berserk and attacks, exchanging blows with the monsters. sang managed to deal damage but sustained severe damage as well. As he charged forward to attack, he was pushed away by Wanti's guild member. As Wante himself faced the monster, he kicked it away from the civilians. While the guild member looks into sang wounds and sees that he is badly hurt but is still in berserk mode due to the cursed sword. She then activates the mana transfer skill calming Sangwu down and dropping the cursed sword. Sangwu requested the healer to save his sister first. Sangwu pleaded to save her. Wante assures that they will make out alive as Sangwu loses consciousness with the last visions of Park Wante slaying the monster. The Korean Hunter Association President Byung Hano sits quietly in his office as he reads the report of projected damage and losses due to the portal outbreak. Before the portal outbreak, Haizang's guild leader Haizang Shin came to speak with him. Haizang asked for the details of the announcement which President Bang Hun explained but Haizang suggested that the announcement should be vague and keep some of the information classified to avoid losses in the future since the original announcement details could make everyone in Korea blame the Hunters Association and that they could suffer greatly. He also said that he should have had not conducted the meeting since it is useless and let people die so that they would naturally ask help from hunters. The president followed this, with a threat from Haizong. Sangwu seems to be fine as he is training one of the clones while he eats. He then praises his skills since it makes money for him, while his skills continuously upgrade and he would never have to worry about the future. He then receives a message from Junmo, and he immediately calls Clone 1 and brings him to Junmo to head to the Horned Rabbit hunting ground as usual, as Clone 2 is training at the gym. Junmo then advised him to work out as well so the results would double with the progress, but Sangwoo prefers not to. He then stated that he wanted to try something easy so he became a hunter, and that the horned rabbits seemed to be making a lot of profits for him, which makes him even wonder if he really needs to level up his strength. Junmo then tells him that he could be the greatest hunter if he wanted to, but Sangwoo seemed happy with what he has currently. Everything turned dark, as Junmo became eyeless, asking him questions. Sang Wu then felt the wounds he got from the battle. He also sees the rest of his family with a similar face to Junmo, blaming him for everything. Sang Wu wakes up in what seems to be a hospital room and is surprised to see Park Wante who advised him not to move due to his wounds. Wante stated that he was lucky considering the wounds he took from the battle. Sang Wu thanks Wante once again, with Wante saying they have a lot to discuss but for next time, as his parents rushed in to see him alive and well. The doctor checked his progress which is positive since he recovered so fast. He should be able to be fully healed sometime next month. It has also been four days since the portal opened and cleanups are left to do with all the strong monsters wiped out. As he tries to remember everything that happened, he thought of his sister and immediately asks her condition but they don't know what to say to him. Jaiwa's wounds have been healed externally but she is in a coma due to being infected with something called the mana absorber virus. 
a virus that keeps absorbing and decomposing the host's mana. Usually, it is not fatal since mana compositions vary from person to person, but when the virus matches the mana, it will be absorbed rapidly making the host unable to function. The option to cure it is really difficult since healing spells don't work since the virus is mana-affiliated. The few options are an S-rank healer's blessing or portal items that are extremely rare and incredibly expensive. Frustrated, sang regrets not prioritizing his family first, not being able to be present when his sister needed him the most, and if he had only been stronger and worked harder, he would have had the ability to save them all, as his wound stitches opens. He was visited by Heian who was able to locate him since his father tried calling him but no use since sang lost his phone. Heian then wished for his recovery so that he could tutor her once again, but he delivered sad news saying that he will drop out of school. Two weeks later, the doctor was surprised to see Sangwa's quick recovery. Sangwa looks in the mirror as he is about to leave the hospital. During Hayan's visit, he informs her of what happened to her sister and that he won't be able to tutor her anymore. He apologizes, as Hayan says that it is okay and that they can still talk to each other. She jokes that she will find a boyfriend in college, hoping that Sangwu won't regret letting go of such a pretty student. Currently, Sangwu has no more time for regrets as he heads out and rides a taxi, then searches for Park Wanti's information. The driver then informs him that they have arrived at the location, Kynus's corporate office. Sangwu heads in and asks to meet Park Wante. The receptionist informs him that he needs an appointment. A man approaches and asks if he is Sangwu, which he confirms. The man then guided him to see Wante. Park Wante welcomes Sangwu into his office as soon as he enters and asks him about his health since getting out of the hospital. Sangwu then says his thanks and says he wants to see him immediately after he gets discharged. Sangwu expressed curiosity about the help that Wante did for his sister whom he paid for the treatment. Wante admitted there were some personal emotions involved since he also has a sister, and asked Sangwu to understand that it wasn't his intention to make him feel indebted. Sangwu then asks Wante the reason he wants to see him. Wante asks him if his clone skills could perform physical activity, which Sangwu confirms. Wante asks for his assistance to save his sister. He emphasizes that he is not asking for repayment for what he did for Sangwu's family but thinks Sangwu is the only one who is capable of saving his sister and his raid team as he begs him. Sangwu recalls the previous accident with his sister and says it's only right since one day has saved his family. It's his turn to save Wanti's sister and asks him what he needs to do. Sangwu then finds himself in the middle of the Kynus Guild's private sparring gym thinking that he should be doing the rescue mission right away but Wante explains that there were two reasons for conducting the training before the rescue mission. First, while executing the mission quickly was important, Team 1 had ample supplies, thanks to his sister's abilities, so there was no immediate urgency. Second, the dungeon's level posed a significant danger, as Team 1, despite being an elite B-class combat team, had suffered injuries and failed to escape. Sangwu asked if Wante meant that it was too dangerous for him to proceed with the mission, to which Wante confirmed. He then explained the concept of humans gaining tremendous strength in emergency situations, and how this could be reflected in stat growth. Wante emphasized that Sangwu needed the additional stats to succeed in the mission, as his battle sense alone wouldn't be sufficient. Sangwu was nervous as Wante charged forward to attack. Junmo then receives a message from Sangwu telling him he will be taking a break from hunting as he is in the hospital. Sangwu then arrives with his face beaten down from training which surprised Junmo. Sangwu explains what happened to his sister and accepts the request of the Kynus Guild. He also informs Junmo to contact him via the spare phone that one of his clones used before and thinks that this is better for now than to restore his contact's friend in order to focus on the mission at hand. Junmo then asks about the wounds, Sangwu tells him it is from his training with Wante which got Junmo angry, and plans to make a complaint but Sangwu calms him down. Sangwu explains that he agreed to it, and informed Junmo of the situation of Wante's sister. He got beaten up, and plans to bring his clones in training. Junmo sighs and decides to bring recovery potions for Sangwu. The next day Sangwu brings one of his clones to training and is feeling confident but the outcome is still the same as he walks with his clone out of the sparring room in tatters. The next day, Sangwu brought two clones with him but nothing changed as they were all beaten again. The following day he brought all of his clones with him with the same thought, 
But just like last time, the same result. Sangwoo enters Junmo's office with a grim, depressed aura due to their defeat. Wanti's skills are just on a different level despite Sangwoo's clones being good at copying someone's movements. Sangwoo thought of an idea to bridge the skill gap and asked Junmo where to buy an item he showed him over the phone. Junmo was worried but Sangwoo assured him that he didn't have to worry. Sangwoo arrives at the sparring room which surprises Wante as Sangwoo's clones are different from before. Wante asked what Sangwoo did to his clones as they looked monstrous. Sangwoo revealed that he made them eat 60 jewels. Sangwoo explained that since clones were considered summoned creatures, they could absorb jewels, and the added stats from the jewels would also be applied to him. Wante allowed Sangwoo to use whatever weapons he liked with the intent to kill Wante as the clones all attacked at the same time. Wante notices the definite improvement in the clones even though their base stats are worse than Sangwoo. Now they are close in strength due to their monsterization. However, Wante easily countered and landed an attack on a clone noticing their reduced accuracy. Sangwoo suddenly attacked but was dodged by Wante. Sangwoo pulled out a gun and fired on Wante. However, it has no effect on Wante who stated that he can't be damaged without mana bullets, then landed a powerful attack on Sangwoo. Sangwoo continued his flurry of attacks with his clones, but it was no use due to the skill gap between them and Wante. As he defended himself, Wante instructed them to let their mana flow from their arms to the blade as if it were part of their bodies, and they'd be able to cut through monsters even with a tree branch if they mastered that method. As Wante was able to break the steel weapons of some of the clones with his wooden sword, Sangwoo still has not given up as he attacks one more time. One day also notices that he is stronger than before. He also acknowledged Sangwoo's ability to boost his stats from the jewels but stated it was not enough. Wante then attacked in quick succession. He informed Sangwoo that he is less than C rank due to his performance. Sangwoo continued to attack and stated that he wouldn't stop at C rank. Sangwoo then calls his clone's attention and orders them to picture Wante as a jewel which empowers them as they attack at the same time again. Sangwoo recalls his reason for getting stronger was not just to help Wante, but to not want to feel the helplessness of having to entrust his family members' lives to someone else in the middle of a disaster. Six months later, at the Sinseildong Station hunting grounds, a party of hunters was getting bullied at the entrance by some members of the Silver Moon Guild who told them to find someplace else to hunt, while the soldier guards were ignoring the situation. The Silver Moon members then told the woman to stay as they would take her to the hunting ground which scared the woman. Suddenly, a man in a hood shows up and he is stopped by the guards. The man tells them he had already paid for his entry. The leader of the bullying group came forward and stated the Silver Moon Guild was using it and threw a punch, but was caught barehanded by the hunter in the hoodie who then countered with a punch of his own causing the bully to fall on his knees. The hunter recalls the Silver Moon Guild but says it makes no sense since it has nothing to do with him as he removes his hoodie, it is Sangwoo. After seeing their party leader down, the rest of the Silver Moon Guild surrounded Sangwoo with their weapons drawn, threatening him of their ranks as D-rank hunters and how he couldn't handle them on his own. Sangwoo's clones arrived surprising the group. Meanwhile, Junwo was visited by Park Wante, due to his request to see what current level and stats Sangwoo has in just six months. Wante looked at the information and thought Sangwoo should be able to handle the mission. He also stated that he has prepared something in case Sangwoo fails. Wante acknowledged Sangwoo's monstrous growth and was almost a C-class. He estimated that Sangwoo might become a high ranker in the future. Back at the dungeon entrance where Sangwoo is, the guards try to stop him from further attacking the remaining Silver Moon Guild members saying he has taken it too far. But Sangwoo stated that they should have stopped it the moment they started attacking the other group, and suggested to the guard that they should just go back to his duty watching the entrance. Sangwoo then commands his clones to break their phones so they can't call anyone. While the other hunters just decided to go to a different hunting ground due to what they saw. Inside the hunting ground, a hunter complains about his job but is startled when he hears someone coming from the entrance, thinking that it was their midway inspection from the guild. He tried to greet them but instead, he saw Sangwoo and remembered him from the Yujangsen hunting grounds. He is shocked to see Sangwoo and he asks him how he got inside with all the Silver Moon Guild members at the entrance. Sangwoo asks him why someone as weak as him is inside this deranked dungeon, noticing that the man isn't there to hunt. 
Sang Wu requested him to tell what was going on in the dungeon and not worry about the guild members outside as he showed him a picture of them surrendering. He then tells him the whole process of collecting jewels. It stays for a long time inside the dungeon, and how cruel the collection is. Some of the collectors have caused harm to the guild, others are from lenders but most are beginner hunters in debt despite the harmful nature of the work. Sang Wu then realizes the situation and tells the hunter to leave now before he changes his mind. The man is touched but suddenly gets told by Sang Wu to leave the jewels. The hunter walks away complaining and Sang Wu commands Clone One to eat all the jewels. Meanwhile, in the inner levels of the dungeon, a Silver Moon Guild worker is being chased by a C-class monster. His name is Yuhayan Kim. As Yuhayan runs from the monster, he suddenly trips and falls down from evading one of the monster's attacks. When he is about to be attacked, he is then pulled by Sang Wu to save him. Sang Wu asks where his collected jewels are. Yuhayan said he dropped the jewels as those monsters started chasing him. Sang Wu continued to ask questions regarding the Haizang guild despite the monsters being close to attacking them. Clone One jumped in and defended them from the attacks. Yuhayan was about to run again when Sang Wu grabbed her to ask more questions as more of his clones attacked the monsters that chased Yuhayan. Sang Wu assured her that they were safe when suddenly Clone One was taken down by the abomination. Sang Wu was surprised but told Yuhayan to wait for him as he faced it himself. He then drew his cursed sword and attacked the monster with a flurry of attack combinations but as he was about to deliver the killing blow. He remembered that the monster that almost killed him which caused him to lose focus for a moment, with his clones defending him as he gathered himself and finished the monster with his final attack, slicing it in half. Yuhayan was surprised that Sang Wu was able to defeat the abomination. Sang Wu wondered why Clone One's wound wasn't healing. Yuhayan mentioned the bone sword of abomination and a curse of corruption on it and stated that they needed a healer to deal with this situation. Yuhayan hands him a potion of some sort to heal Clone One. The potion was effective Yuhayan tells him that it's only for now due to a side effect that will drain its life force since her skill is poison. Sang Wu then commands Clone Number One to hunt now before dying from the poison. Yuhayan stated that it was Sang Wu's turn to talk about himself, expressing curiosity about his skill and the fact he had killed an abomination. He also never heard of anyone like him in the B ranks. Sang Wu said that it was normal since he was in E rank, which shocked Yuhayan. She asks why is he in a D rank dungeon. However, Sang Wu didn't answer and continued to ask her some questions. In the Wailolo Guild warehouse, Guild Master Miho Han is overseeing a collection of items as her guild manager Siena Kim asks why she is collecting jewels. Miho stated that one asked for it and that he'd pay a lot. She said it's for a person named Sang Wu Jong and that these jewels are something that he would use. Sang Wu asks Wu Haiyan why she was talking about the Haizan guild as she was running away. Yu Haiyan tells him that the Silver Moon is under Haizang to do the dirty work for them and that there are a lot of people who are in the area due to forced labor. Sang Wu asks Yu Haiyan why she was there. She remembers a grim memory and tells Sang Wu that it is none of his business. Yu Haiyan regretted telling Sang Wu about her skill while Sang Wu bid her farewell. Sang Wu told him that she could leave since there were no more Silver Moon members outside and complimented her poison skill. Yuhayan thinks Sang Wu is bullying her but Sang Wu hands Yuhayan a bloody business card, telling her that if she wants to look for work or take revenge on Haizang Guild she can contact him. He commands Clone 5 to escort her to the entrance. Sang Wu continues to hunt monsters as Clone 1 kills another monster before he finally falls due to the poison. He then resummons Clone 1 and continues to hunt heading deeper into the dungeon. Unaware that there are two members of the Silver Moon Guild whom Sang Wu fought at the dungeon entrance, scared of what Sang Wu is capable of and call him a freak, they talk about how his skill works. As for going back to the dungeon, the party leader presses a part of the wall inside the dungeon that leads into another room which is a laboratory, it is for jewel crystals, where they create a condensed and purified version that is a hundred times more effective at increasing stats than a normal jewel. However, the effect is also heightened causing loyal summons to lose control and not recognize their owner. The WHA banned jewel crystals due to how dangerous it is. But that was the case before the DP project. Tron Industries is right now making a product that would make it available for humans to consume the jewels by further refining it but securing jewels itself seems difficult due to its illegality. 
making the price for it skyrocket. The party leader decided to let things be for now and come back tomorrow. After the two left, someone also made an entrance to the secret laboratory. It was Yuhayan who entered, after chasing off Clone 5. She then finds the jewel crystals and collects them. As she is getting out of the hidden room, other collectors and hunters rush toward the exit. She sees Clone 5 guiding them. Clone 5 sees Yuhayan join the group and thinks that his task is fulfilled. Yuhayan was overjoyed after escaping the dungeon while cursing Silver Moon and Haizang Guild. Meanwhile, Samu is pleased with the pile of jewels he collected. Clone number one asks if he can consume them, but Sangwoo prefers not to as his clone skill is still on cooldown. He then receives a message from Junmo asking him to come to Kainas Guild headquarters tomorrow for a mission briefing. The following day, the two members of the Silver Moon Guild find out that the jewel crystals are no longer in the hidden room storage. They question the guards. The guard confirms that no other people went in except Sangwoo and the people they trapped inside. He realizes that it would be hard to take back the jewels from Sangwoo. As Yuhayan walks back to his place, he complains about what happened but is thankful he did not come out empty-handed. As she checks the jewel crystals, the JM Agency business card falls out of her pocket. She then remembers Sangwoo praising her skill but thought of Sangwoo as an asshole as she walks away. Inside Odin's Tower, an unexplored S-rank dungeon. Juan Beck is the first to discover and attempt to clear it. He was Korea's strongest first-generation hunter, but he went missing inside and never returned. Despite countless hunters taking on the tower, no one was able to clear even the first area except one hunter, Gurge Lucas, the jumper. Currently, Kynas Guild's raid team one is trapped inside the dungeon, and one of them is Park Wanti's sister, the team captain. Inside Wanti's office, Junmo asks for more information about the tower as Wante tells him that the tower has a unique structure, it has an entrance but there is no exit. The only thing that can get through is mana, making telepathy the sole form of communication, also making the options for escape limited as well, finishing the dungeon or by teleportation. Considering Sang was cloning skills he is the best candidate to do the mission if something goes wrong. Team 1 has a way of getting out but something went wrong. Wante then explained what happened. Five years ago, after the great disaster in 2005, Park Wante was only 16 years old and his sister Park Yuna was nine yet both of them were trying to survive during that time. Despite her young age, she displayed an immense talent for her skill which was subspace, a skill that is able to put items in an area that works like an inventory, and thanks to that, they were able to survive a lot of times due to her skill that can even fit humans inside. Fast forward to the near present, Yuna hits Wante at his back who is still anxious about their upcoming mission saying that they need to at least look for a teleport skill user just in case. However, Yuna mentioned they already had teleportation scrolls and there are only a few dozen teleporters in the world and they would not be able to find one soon. She also mentioned that Ray Team 1 is in the best condition. With her skill they have a great chance to clear the dungeon. She asks Wante if he trusts her. Wante is still not confident of the operation despite all the assurance he got from his sister and the raid team. Yuna promises that they will come straight back if things get dangerous, and tells him that she knows the feeling of leaving a family and never coming back. As she demonstrates how her skill has improved, showing him all the supplies in her subspace that she has as well as the teleportation scrolls, and just like that, they moved out to the dungeon. Wante was still worried when they left but his assistant tells him that he is just too protective of his sister and that he should put some faith in her, as someone knocks at their office telling him that it's time. That same day they left was the same day Wante hosted the awakening program that Sangui joined. Their contact procedure was once a week via the teleportation scrolls that Wante provided. Considering the bad reception outside, they formed another team to wait at the entrance of the dungeon. The first week leading to the first month, all was going well and the communication was good, but everything changed after that month. At the entrance of Odin's tower where they had set up the temporary guild barracks, Wante knows that they should be reaching the 25-mile checkpoint. As they were preparing the telepathy scroll, the receiver informed them that as they were on the 3,000 feet into the final stage of the first floor, they were ambushed by an unidentified monster. Most members are battling the monster, injuries sustained when suddenly everything went unrecognizable due to multiple telepathy scrolls being used at once. 
When a portal opens via the teleportation scroll as one hunter suddenly comes out with grave injuries, Wante realizes the result of his irresponsibility. Wante knew the hunter who came out injured from the subspace. They called for medics as the portal tried to emit mana again his assistant repels it so their receiver would still be able to get messages if there were and instructed him on what to do. The hunter who came out of the subspace injured was named Sante, who tells Wante that the monsters destroyed their scrolls but due to his injuries he was needed to be sent immediately to the hospital. Wante then gets informed that his sister has a message, saying that the battle is over, and apologizes that their raid was a failure. Eunice stated that she could wait, and asked him not to rush for their rescue and promised she would be back no matter what. That was the last message that Wante received from Yuna and Ray Team 1. Since then, Wante attempted to ask for help from other strong hunters he knew, but none of them even considered going and the mission was considered a death sentence some even mocked him for letting his sister and raid team go to the tower. Fast forward to rescuing Sang Wu and knowing what skills he had. Sang Wu realizes why he was told to level up due to the intensity of the mission, which Wante confirms and applauds him for making it seem possible due to his immense improvement in a short amount of time. He then tells Sang Wu that the rescue mission is tomorrow, as he will be escorted up to the entrance of the tower. Inside a hotel, members of the Silver Moon Guild are beaten due to their failure to gather the crystals and the jewel crystals and for failing the mission by their guild leader, Jukil Yang. He then asks for more information on who beat them at the Xinxiu Dong entrance. One member tells him what happened but they were not able to identify him even by looking at the database for D-rank hunters or higher. Jukio was enraged hearing this. He stomped one of his members as he told them what could happen if they didn't meet their quota to the Haizan Guild on time. He then commands his members to find the person who did it and bring them to him. As he realizes that the result could still be the same, he decides to appoint his vice director Chan Siang Khan to execute the mission himself. The next day at the JM agency, Sangwoo tells Junmo that he feels strange about how Wante seems to be leaving something important about the reason why his sister went to raid the tower. Junmo says that he doesn't know a lot in the hunter world but is familiar with the tower. In an interview regarding George Lucas clearing the tower, he was asked by the reporters about what was inside the tower. He said with a serious look on his face that it was empty and there were only monsters, no treasure, or items, and that never again should anyone enter the tower recklessly, as it results in death. Sangwoo was still curious why Wante sent his best team to clear the dungeon but decided to just focus on rescuing them. As they head into their office, they see Wu Yuhayan sleeping at their office door. Sangwoo tells him what happened when they met, and tells her to come to them if she did not have anywhere else to work. Wu Yuhayan wakes up seeing Junmo so close to her when suddenly her stomach growls. The three of them went to the nearby restaurant. Yahayan ate hastily as Sangwoo asked if she came to work for the agency she confirmed. Junmo asks what her skill is and she tells him that she can appraise items and make potions, which Sangwoo chimes in stating that it's potions that will kill you. Yuhayan was angered and explained she also knows how to make potions that don't kill. Sangwoo tells Junmo that he likes her skills and wants to use them. Junmo asked if Sangwoo was planning to use it on his clones. Sangwoo confirms. Sangwoo then tells Junmo to prepare equipment for making potions. Sangwoo prepared to leave and told Yuhayan he would be heading to the dungeon not to hunt but something different she then threw a couple of potions to Sangwoo. One potion was for mana and one was for strength the only downside was the strength potion would make his muscles melt and that the mana potion would make his body explode. Sangwoo heads out with the rest of his clones. At the Wailo Guild's warehouse, one member was ordered to deliver the jewels to the Kinas Guild. As she enters, she sees one of the guards on the ground lifeless and sees more of them who are in the same state. She is shocked and sees the destroyed wall of the warehouse. She prepared for battle and activated her skill radar. She detects three of them inside but as she is about to dash in, she is strangled by someone who seems invisible and knocks her unconscious. It is the vice director of the Silver Moon Guild Chan Siang Kong who then enters the warehouse to secure the jewels. They set the warehouse on fire to cover their tracks and decided it was time to find the person who stole their jewel crystal. Sangwoo arrives in Iceland in a jet, his first time overseas. As he lands, he is greeted by two guards saying that Wante is already inside and waiting at what seems to be a Stonehenge-like structure. It is called the Valhalla Portal, the entrance to Odin's Tower. 
As he enters through an endless cliff that drops off into space, Sangwoo quickly heads to the temporary barracks outside of the tower. Inside, Wendy discusses with the vice director of the guild about what happened to Yolo Guild's warehouse. As soon as they see Sangwoo, they immediately welcome him and give Sangwoo and his clones a coat. Wante then shows the map of the dungeon and tells him the distance of where they were last located, 24 miles inside the dungeon. Sangwoo expected that it would be far but Wante tells him they were taking it slow due to no risk of food shortage. Then they gave him three teleportation scrolls since they had spares and each one of his clones would be given since they were the keys to the mission. Wante instructs him how to use the scrolls as the vice director said before Team 1 was cut off to check the outside situation, every every day at 2 p.m. She assumes Sangwoo would see traces of the battle. Wante asks Sangwoo if there are any more questions but Sangwoo what he is going to eat for dinner with his sisters once she gets back, which makes Wante grin and say that for the first in a long time, they will eat at home. Sangwoo fully prepares all the things he needs as his clones hold the wall to get inside the tower. He then initiates his familiar skill as one who looks at him, with the belief that he can do it. Sangwoo opens his eyes at a vast glacier field with blizzard currents, as he feels the cold despite his cold resistance. All his clones are inside with him taking over clone number one as his familiar skill has gone up to a level in which he can go beyond sharing senses with the targeted subordinate to take direct control. They go on ahead and make their way through the tower. He confirms that the portal exit gets blocked as they enter. He checked the information about the monsters at the beginning of the dungeon which were the E-class frost bats. While reading the information the other clones killed the bats in the area, and knew there was a chief frost bat among the group. As he was about to take it on, his clones suddenly jumped in and killed it quickly. He was kind of disappointed not being able to partake in the kill but decides they keep going. Despite the continuous attacks of frost bats, they were able to cover eight miles already. Sangwoo realizes that they should be encountering new monsters at that point, and as soon as he says it, a group of ice gorillas shows up as his clones prepare for the fight. They immediately initiate magic bullets to shoot bullets with mana to increase damage, which was very effective as Sangwoo dictates how the battle formation should be. They killed the monsters with precision and quickness. Everything seemed to be going well until the ground suddenly shakes and destroyed as a large arm appears, which caught everyone off guard. Back at the temporary barracks, the vice director asks Wente if he thinks Sangwoo is doing fine as even their most elite team had difficulties in that place. Wente assures her of what Sangwoo is capable of. Wente was actually thinking of just infiltrating and rescuing them while avoiding fighting and that is why he asked Sangwoo to raise his stats to at least C rank but he did not expect that Sangwoo would be able to raise most of his stats by 20 in only 6 months and that his stats are already on par with B rank hunters. More importantly his clones are about the same skill level as he is despite their stats being lower. They are still capable in battle and could be leveled as B-rank hunters. Respectively. The vice director was surprised since Raid Team 1's average rank is B. One day sees that Sangwoo is on equal footing with Raid Team 1 and says that if the jewels they requested from the YLO guild were delivered, he would be much stronger before he entered. They discussed the ice golem being a problematic encounter but Wante already mentioned it to Sangwoo, telling him to avoid it so it could be no problem. However, Sangwoo was already face to face with the ice golem inside the tower. He attacked with the cursed sword but dealt no damage to the ice golem. The monster let out a loud roar and attacked but Sangwoo managed to dodge, thinking that there was no way to damage the ice golem. The ice gorillas tried to attack but one of them was grabbed by the ice golem and eats it. Shocked with what happened, they tried to get away from the ice golem's continuous attacks. Sangwoo remembers the instruction to aim for the ice golem's core but is having a hard time locating it. He then sees the core on its chest but doesn't know how to destroy it since magic bullets are not doing any damage. The ice golems slammed the ground for an area of effect attack which caused clone number 5 to be grabbed by the ice golem. It was a problem since clone number 5 was one of the three clones that had the teleportation scroll which made Sangwoo think of an idea. As the ice golem was about to eat clone number 5, he dashes in to grab something from the clone and leaps away as the ice golem eats clone number 5. He then showed a torn piece of the teleportation scroll that number 5 was carrying as something inside the golem exploded. Sangwoo quickly decided it would be best to teleport it away instead of attacking its core and as expected, the core teleported to the temporary barracks at the entrance which surprised the people there. 
He then gained a lot of status upgrades due to killing the Ice Golem, and his clone skill leveled up, enabling him to summon at 7 clones at most. He was feeling good about it since it was difficult to level up unlike his other skills but still decided not to summon a 7th one, right away as he heads closer to raid team 1. Meanwhile, George Lucas was presented with a list of people who wanted to see him for the month. As he looked into it he asked if there was anyone from South Korea and was confirmed there was none, which surprised him, and thought something changed as he orders to cancel all requests and proceed with the Academy's inauguration ceremony. At some apartment, the hunter that Sangwoo encountered at the entrance of the Shinseildong dungeon entrance is having a talk with Gyunseok. They were talking about the situation that he was in with the Silvermoon Guild and he thinks he was still quite talented since he was able to get away. There was a sudden knock on the door and as Gyunseok opened, he was attacked by someone. Chanseong Kong made his entrance and addressed Park Gapsu, he was the third person they managed to find. Chan Seung asks him who was the culprit that beat the Silvermoon Guild members at the dungeon entrance a while ago. Gyun Seok retaliates and attacks him, but his punch is easily caught as Chan Seung brings him down to his knees just by gripping his fist and continuously attacks Gyun Seok while making threats. Gapsu tried to stop the fight by cooperating to come with them but Chan Seung still went on due to Gyun Seok's attitude earlier. He continues to beat Gyun Seok and is about to kill him when Gapsu says that he knew the person who did it making him stop, and smiles with a grin evil look on his face with happiness telling them it only needs a little beating to get information out of them. Back at Odin's tower, Sangwoo and his clones continue to advance, he wants to take it slow now and be more cautious since they have not seen a monster in a while, they suddenly come across some corpses and think of what could possibly be the cause. As they are almost near their destination, they will now go and look for any traces of battle to increase the chance of locating Raid Team 1 as he remembered the said time for Raid Team 1 to check outside their subspace. One of his clones attacks something behind him. Suddenly he saw one ice-like type monster in front of him. His clone was able to block the attack with his hand and Sangwoo was surprised that it was nearly hard for him to detect where it came from since it was nearly invisible. He then heard more footsteps in the snow and he sees more of them in a cluster, charging at him. He then realizes the situation at hand and the reason why Ray Team 1 was not able to exit last time, and that without realizing it, they were already in the middle of their trap. His clones then stand their ground as they continue to assault the rest of the monsters, when they suddenly vanished again. He then sees his clones were able to block and counterattack which made him wonder how they were able to do it. He then lets clone number 1 take control of his body and observe the situation. He sees that his clones detect the invisible monsters via the sound of the wind and the sound it makes during movement, which makes him realize he still has a long way to go in order to be on the same level as his clones in terms of battle. Inside the subspace, Raid Team 1 Captain Park Yuna was reminded by one of his teammates to look outside since it was already 2 p.m. She is in a dilemma whether to tell them to have hope considering their situation for the past few months when she heard a sound as she was opening the subspace. Sangwoo still observes the situation as his clones try to repel the incoming attacks. He is still trying to get used to it, and looks at the current status of his clones, which makes him worry since he can't calculate the enemy numbers and thinks that they are too many to deal with. When suddenly the subspace opens, he rushes towards. Yuna sees them and informs her team that there is indeed someone outside. Raid Team 1 looks at the clones with shock as Sangwoo tells them he is here to save them, so they should save him from his predicament. As Sangwoo rushes into the subspace, Yuna orders Raid Team 1 to support him as they all work in unison, with defense and magic attack combinations in order for Sangwoo and his clones to make it inside the subspace. It was a success, and Yuna closes the subspace. Sangwoo then tells them he is here to rescue them, but everybody looks at him weirdly. Yuna asks him if he is from the Kinas Guild. Sangwoo introduces himself and explains that he is there at the request of their guild master Park Wante. Raid Team 1 members were relieved by hearing this. Yuna asked about Siang Ti and Sangwoo informed her that he was safe but had not woken up yet. Sangwoo then implies that they should get out of the dungeon now and that Wante is already waiting anxiously at the entrance. But the whole Raid Team is hesitant. Sangwoo felt that something didn't feel right as he looked at the members and noticed they were missing some members since they were a total of 10 when they entered but there were only 8 members currently in the subspace. Yuna then asks a favor to help them one more time. It is to retrieve the dead body of their member, 
as they can't leave someone behind. Sangwu asks for more information about what happened, and Yuna tells him of the story. They were suddenly ambushed, and their healer was the one who was targeted. Sangwu thinks about how he was also targeted first, and thinks that the invisible monsters outside target the most vulnerable ones when attempting an ambush. Yuna stated that she opened her subspace immediately, and ordered the raid team to fall back. She assessed the situation they were in, and considered the team's safety first rather than facing the monster head-on. They then used the teleport scroll right away to report, but everything was so chaotic that they did not notice that one invisible monster was able to slip in. Siangti then goes and saves Yuna from the attack and is stabbed by the monster. All of their spare teleportation scrolls were lost as it happened, resulting in the portal closing without the rest of the members being able to enter. Yuna had the choice of entering but if she got out, the subspace would also close and would result in the rest of the team losing a safe place or supplies and would eventually die. Sangwu asks about the location of the dead member. Yuna opens a part of the subspace in which they all see the dead body of their member. Sangwu thought of the dangers considering the distance there is between them and the monsters that lurked outside. Sangwu agrees to retrieve the corpse which makes Ray Team 1 happy. Sangwu stated his condition and informed them that his reason for being there was to save them, not to increase the casualties, and that if he saw any chance of them failing, he would prioritize getting them out first. Yuna agreed. Also, Sangwu stated that he and his clones would retrieve the body, making Yuna worried saying that would be too dangerous. Sangwu then assures them to not worry, telling them with confidence that they are not real people but clones, which surprised Yuna. In JM Agency, Chan Siung sits on top of Junmo's beaten body as his lackeys destroy the office and says that Junmo should have stayed low after getting kicked out from Haizung Guild. He then asks where Sangwu is, and he puts his foot in Junmo's arms threatening him to break it, but Junmo doesn't answer and Chan Siung breaks his arm. Junmo lets out a loud cry as one of Chan Siung's lackeys finds the document of Sangwu and hands it to Chong Siung. They then plan to take Junmo and send some of their members to Sangwu's address. Yohayan was outside the door all along and was shocked that Silvermoon was present at their office. Junmo asks Chan Siang why they are looking for Sangwu. Chan Siang tells him what happened and asks him about the jewel crystals. He stated that Sangwu probably did not tell Junmo of stealing their crystals, and they were the actual victims. Yohayan was shocked to hear that the Silvermoon Guild thought that Sangwu was the culprit who stole the crystals. Back in the subspace, Sangwu tells them his plan. Two of his clones will take the teleport scroll and stay behind to guard the entrance of the subspace, and three of them will go out again to retrieve the body, emphasizing they should never come outside since their safety is his top priority. The raid team insists on helping Sangwu which he recognizes due to their abilities but states that he is the one responsible for bringing them back safely but Yuna tells that Sangwu took on the aggro of a bunch of the monsters before as he ran towards them earlier. Sangwu explained he had other plans if they couldn't help him earlier. He asks the team to trust him and wait in the subspace. Yuna thinks for a second but eventually agrees. Sangwu prepares as he thinks about the time that he was training himself to the bone for the past six months together with his clones being fed with jewels and got a skill called Monster Devour which absorbs the essence of a monster once killed with a 12% chance. It was the secret why he was able to obtain the stats needed for him to pass Wanti's assessment but he still wants more, and is not satisfied with his current power. He then readies his clones as he swaps weapons with clone number 4, and instructs him to leave right away once they recover the body. Yuna then reminds him that the monsters don't easily leave their last position, and can stay there for days, and that he must be careful. Sangwu takes the advice and thanks Yuna as the subspace opens. After exiting, he observes the surroundings first, and then dashes as fast as they can towards the body of the late member of Raid Team 1. The clones that were left in the subspace look at them as they go, and instruct Raid Team 1 to keep their distance away from the entrance. Raid Team 1 members are still worried and want to help Sangwu, but Yuna said that considering what they had seen earlier when Sangwu ran towards them away from the monsters, and that this is Odin's Tower which is not just some place where you can reach your location just by running away, they should just wait and trust Sangwu and believe in his plan. Sangwu continues to rush towards the body. As he dodges one of the invisible monsters that attacked him and blocks the second attack, he was still able to block it despite not having to guess the accurate location but due to feeling it, 
as he commands his clones to keep pushing through the monsters that are still increasing in numbers. Sangwu was then able to locate the body despite the number of monsters blocking his way when suddenly one of his clones was attacked from behind. He then realizes that they are surrounded by the monsters they left behind that had already caught up to them. He then uses the blue potion that was given to him by Yehian. He immediately feels the instant surge of mana power coursing through his body. He activates magic bullet and shoots a powerful attack in a line, destroying the monsters in front with one shot which shocked Yuna and the others. Despite having a hard time moving, he commands clone number two to retrieve the body as he feels that he is about to blow up. He shouts at his clones to run as he slams the ground causing it to shake and be destroyed giving enough time for his clones to get back at the subspace with the dead body. The clones then activated the teleportation scroll. Raid Team 1 insists on not easily entering the portal since there are still people outside but the clones say to not worry as it is just another clone. They entered the teleportation portal leaving Sangwoo behind. As his body exploded due to the potion he took. He then activates his monster devour skill to absorb the essence of the monsters he killed during the explosion, enabling him to absorb the stats of the ice guardians. At the hospital, Songtae is still in a coma, is being attended by one of the keenest guild members, who tells him that the day of their rescue is today and that it should be over by now, and that he should wake up in order for him to greet others with a smile. Songtae's finger suddenly flinches as if he heard what was said to him. At the entrance of Odin's tower, a portal suddenly shows up in front of Wante and the vice director. Wante suddenly has flashbacks of what happened at the accident before, and he grabs onto his chest and closes his eyes to calm himself down when he opens it. Yuna was already in front of him, causing him to cry. Sangwu is back to his original body with a headache due to his first experience of blowing himself up. Wante suddenly hugs her while crying telling her it's all okay now and that they are all back making her let go of all of her emotions as she cries telling Wante one of her members died because of her and thinks that no one was coming to rescue them making her really scared. Wante thanks her for coming back safely as the people at the hospital are shocked when Songte who was just in a comatose state earlier wakes up. As they are packing up to head back to Korea, clone number four hands Sangwoo his items and equipment as he is looking at the increase in his stats. Wante approaches him with Yuna and thanks him. Sangwoo was being humble about what he did telling them to raise their heads and that he only took the offer because it was good. One day states that this is not over and that he should feel free to contact them whenever he needs them, and he will help them no matter what, together with the Kinas Guild. Sangwoo then gives back one of the unused teleport scrolls. One day insists that he keep it since he was already planning to give it to him along with other items that were not used for the expedition. Sangwoo still insists on giving the scroll back since it does not make him feel comfortable if they don't take it back. Yuna asked if he had been there all this time while Sangwoo suddenly felt that giving it back was a waste. Wante explains what Sangwoo did and that indeed he was there all along since Yuna thought the clones were real people who were just lying in order for them to calm down. Wante himself does not believe at first that such a skill exists and thinks of what Sangwoo will be in the future. They all exit the portal and are back in Iceland. Sangwoo and Wante talk for a bit about how Wante would have to check on their health and how they should also prepare for a funeral when suddenly Sangwoo's phone received a lot of messages just now due to the dungeon not having receptions. He then sees the message from Yohayan about what happened at the agency and what happened to Junmo, which angers him, and then tells Wante that he needs to be somewhere right now. Wante asks what happened and he tells him the situation that the Silver Moon Guild abducted Junmo due to his scuffle with its members one time at the dungeon. Wante then hands him the teleportation scroll but Sangwoo is still hesitant to take it. Wante insists and reminds him of what he said earlier that they will support him no matter what. Yuhayan is able to follow where Junmo was taken as she hides from the guards. But she is grabbed by one of those guards. The guard questions who she is and why she was there when a portal appears with Sangwoo coming out about to attack. As Sangwoo appears at the back of the guard, his clones at the same surround the other guard on watch as he strangles the other one by the neck, asking him where is Junmo. Yuhayan stops him and tells him she knows where they are hiding him. Sangwoo calms himself down and ties the guards they apprehended. Yohayan then tells Sangwoo that Junmo is inside the storage warehouse close by and that some guards are on patrol around the place. Sangwoo then tells Yohayan to wait as he assembles all his clones to infiltrate the warehouse. Inside the warehouse, 
Junmo is tied in a chair as Chansiang Kang mocks Junmo, telling him why it has to be their guild. He then asked one of his lackeys when was Yung Sangwu coming, he was informed that since he was still abroad, he should be coming in a couple of hours and that it would take a while. When they suddenly heard a noise outside, all of them were on alert as the storage door was forced open and Sangwu showed up asking if they were from Silverman. Chansiang thought he would take another couple of hours. He asked Sangwu if he is alone since he heard from the report that there are other guys in masks. Junmo shouts that Sangwu should not be there but Sangwu says just hold on a little longer, as he will do the same thing they did to him. One Silvermoon attacks but Sangwu easily fends off the first attack and continues to demolish the other Silvermoon guild members one by one in a quick manner also breaking their arms. Chansiang expected this to happen and told Sangwu that if he told him where the jewel crystal was they would let them go. Sangwu didn't know what he was talking about and stated that they already crossed the line so this would not end peacefully. Chansiang then brought out the document containing Sangwu's information when they ransacked their office, telling him that his stats are overall amazing and that he should be around C to be rank with only his stats, making him able to beat almost all of the hunters in this field. He then proceeds to talk about his cloning skill and asks for the reason for him to be fighting them without using any skills, and laughs hysterically. He continues to talk about there are people like Sangwu who has awakened but has trash skill and that's the reason why they focus around their stats like an idiot since there is not any skill that they can use properly except strike. And thinks that the masked guys who follow him also have lame skills since he noticed that they gather in a group. Sangwu then calls out his clones and tells Chansiang he can test them and see for himself as his clones show up and are ready to take them head on. The members are surprised by their sudden appearance and tell Chansiung that the other guards outside are already beaten by the look of things. Chansiung then thinks at least he is not outnumbered as he thinks that he did not like the idea of beating a single guy with a group. Sangwu noticed how confident Chansiung was and wanted to see how great his skill was. Chansiung then proceeded to activate his skill stealth, which his subordinate thinks was the best stealth skill that even the highest rank detecting skill couldn't detect. Junmo is also shocked by his sudden disappearance. As Chansiang goes around Sangwu and states that feeling his presence and aura is useless since it removes traces of him, but the clones are unimpressed as Sangwu's clones are able to detect Chansiang movements. Sangwu just lets out a sigh. As Chansiang is about to attack, he orders his clones to get him. They immediately make their move and restrain Chansiang, putting him in a state of shock at how he was able to be detected despite his stealth skill. Meanwhile, Sangwa's friends are in a bar celebrating their third year in university, they are having a conversation about them not having girlfriends or partners when one of them suddenly remembers Sangwu and thinks of what he was doing right now since he has not contacted them since, and even was surprised that he continued to be a hunter despite his personality. Jiangda told them that they do not know Sangwu at all, and what he does when he gets mad. He told them a story of when they were in third grade. Jiangdu was about to get home when a couple of gangsters cornered him to steal his money. Sangwu saw it, and despite being little at that time still tried to attack the gangsters because he was robbed by those guys before, and was mad that Jiangdu was being harassed. Jiangdu said that Sangwu is merciful when it only concerns himself, but when people around him are harmed, he snaps. Back at the storage facility, Chansiang was surprised and asked how Sangwu was able to detect him. Sangwu instructs some of his clones to take Junmo to the hospital. Sangwu informed him that his skill didn't matter since he just came back from killing a group of monsters with skills similar to his. The clones restrained Chansiang and Sangwu stated that his skill was not trash and that he just did not train his physical body, and that Chansiang was right that he has great stats and then let out a powerful punch to his stomach which sent him flying, making him cough up blood due to the damage. One of his clones informed him that one of Silver Moon members got away and the rest had been taken care of. He then commands them to focus on getting Junmo to the hospital to tend to his wounds as Chansiang was still able to move despite the attack from Sangwu. Chansiang couldn't believe what was going on since according to the reports Sangwu's strength status is only at 19 and his clones are also formidable. He also knew it was impossible to get out if he got caught by two of those. He notices the red potion in Sangwu's pocket. He then tries to distract him with a little bit of conversation then he casts stealth again for the second time telling Sangwu that he has not seen everything he got. Sangwu is undeterred as the clones get ready. 
Chan Xiang was thinking of how he was able to be detected despite his skill and assumed that he was able to be detected due to sounds and ripples of his movement, so he decided to up his speed to block the sounds making Sang Wu unable to see him easily. Sang Wu acknowledges the situation and what he can do as Chan Xiang dashes into him, but it is useless. As Sang Wu is still able to hit him causing him to fly off again. However, Chan Xiang laughs it off and mocks Sang Wu as he shows him he had stolen the red potion that was in his pocket, believing that it was the source of his strength and the reason he became strong in a short amount of time. Sang Wu advised him to not drink it but Chan Xiang did not listen and chugged the whole potion making his strength stat almost double than it was before, even causing the ground to tremble due to the increase in Chan Xiang's strength. Chan Xiang makes threats to Sang Wu and tells him to give the name of the potion maker and he will let him go after taking a limb. Sang Wu assessed the situation, considering two of his clones were tending to Genmo so he had to deal with him with only two of his clones. Chan Xiang attacks and two of his clones try to stop him, but they are unable to stop Chong Xiang, and continue his attack on Sang Wu who was able to block it but was pushed back by the attack. Chan Xiang tells him that he did not only see his stats but also his personal information as some of his lackeys have come to where Sang Wu's parents are currently living. Meanwhile, Chong Xiang's people were able to defeat the hunter guarding the place. Sang Wu's parents were at their apartment when there was a sudden knock on the door. Chan Xiang threatens Sang Wu as he attacks, that just a call from him, all his family would be buried alive. As Sang Wu struggles to defend, his clones then attack Chan Xiang from behind which distracts him. Sang Wu uses the cursed sword with his blood and launches a powerful attack on Chan Xiang, but it only manages to destroy his weapons. Enraged, Chen Xiang attacks sending Sang Wu flying outside the storage facility. Chan Xiang proceeds to attack one of his clones as another one tries to come from behind but is no use as well. Sang Wu thought about the overwhelming effect of the potion as he saw Wu Haiyan together with one of his clones and one apprehended Silvermoon Guild member, asking him if he going to lose after acting cool earlier. Sang Wu shrugs it off as Chan Xiang is in front of him and is about to call the lackeys that he sent to Sang Wu's parents when his arms suddenly fall limp and lose power as he also falls to the ground, unaware that the potion he drank earlier had a side effect. The one he drank can double his strength, but the after effect is that it will melt his muscle. Chan Xiang then tried to talk over the phone to his lackeys to hostage Sang Wu's family while telling Sang Wu to not harm him, or his family would die. He also asked for an antidote, but there was none as the phone was answered, but it was one of the high ranked members of the Kinas Guild who answered the call. When Sang Wu's father opened the door due to someone who knocked earlier, they were greeted by the same man who answered the call Chan Xiang made. The man greeted Sang Wu's parents apologized for coming in at a late hour, and informed them that Sang-woo had completed his mission successfully, and is now heading back to Korea, while also holding one of Chan Seong's lackeys by the head, hiding him from the sight of sang -woo's parents, he cut their conversation short so sang -woo's father could close the door. The man then confronted all the Silvermoon Guild members present. The man answered the call made by Chan Seong, after destroying all the members of the Silvermoon Guild. The man threw the phone, made another call, and reported that it was already taken care of, assuming sang -woo was now also aware that his family was now safe from harm. Shocked by what happened, Chan Xiang continues to struggle from the effect of the potion. sang -woo looks at him with rage, telling him that if he wants to live, he should focus on his energy to breathe, he then grabs one of Chan Xiang's arms and tells him not to lay a finger on the people around him, and then breaks it like a twig, causing Chan Xiang to cry in pain. Sang Wu immediately heads into the hospital where Genmo is currently staying with two of his clones. He jumps to the fifth floor since it is not possible for visitors to enter due to this late hour. He asks for Genmo's condition, and Genmo informs that he is fine as he was treated by healers. Genmo notices blood on Sang Wu's face and asks him the same question, but Sang Wu shrugs it off, telling him that his regeneration is quite high and that it's only a scratch then informs him that he does not need to worry about the Silver Moon Guild anymore. Junmo was somehow relieved as sang -woo asked if he should get his rank re-evaluated, considering his improvements since the Fishman Portal. He also hasn't been tested yet after that incident. sang -woo originally wanted to increase his stats to earn money for the hospital fees but due to the incidents that happened, changed his mind thinking that if he was an A-class hunter or even stronger, 
The Silver Moon Guild would not do such a thing in the first place, nor even attacking Junmo and their office, and that is why he wants to be at a higher rank. Junmo stated that it would be very beneficial to the agency, and would be extremely grateful since a high rank hunter would make the agency stronger. However, Junmo also warned him he would also attract a lot of attention and similar situations like this could happen. Sangwoo made a decision and headed to the hunter agency to reevaluate his rank. His information was confirmed by one of the clerks and normally, rank evaluations would be in the form of groups since the usual understanding is the monsters are usually stronger than the hunter. But since it is Sangwoo, things such as normal do not apply to him. He was then instructed on how the process works in order for him to be qualified for promotion. He asked if he could skip the tests for D, C, and B. The staff was surprised and told him that a hunter could only apply for a rank above him. Sangwoo asked for the prerequisites for getting a D rank and informs him that the D rank quest was to defeat a fishman. The clerk doubted that Sangwoo could take on the quest and assumed he would be back to cancel the application. Sangwoo then makes a phone call and continues to stand by the hunter agency's lounge. Two hours later the clerk is annoyed at him since he has not moved at all after accepting the application. Sangwoo then stands up, goes back to the clerk, and tells him that he has finished the test. The clerk was about to ask if wanted to cancel the application, but Sangwoo informed him that it was finished and he got the evidence, as one of his clones killed the fishman. The clerk could not believe him since he did not even see him leave the premises, but Sangwoo insisted on checking the system and that the hunting grounds had sent a confirmation message as well. Upon checking, the clerk was surprised that it was indeed completed. He could not believe it, and even called the hunting grounds himself to confirm if it was true, and the hunting ground officers confirmed that there was a recording of Sangwoo coming to the hunting ground. With a lot of questions in his head, the clerk immediately increases his rank from E to D. The staff assumed that Sangwoo was cheating and planned to report what happened. Sangwoo then tells the clerk that he wants to register for C rank, which surprised him even more. Meanwhile, Wu Hyun retrieves the jewel crystal she stole from the Silverman Guild. She thinks back to when she admitted to Sangwoo that it was she who stole the crystals, putting Junmo and Sangwoo's family in danger. Thinking that she would be in trouble and recalling what Sangwoo did to all the people who hurt them. However, Sangwoo stated it was not her fault, and the reason was they thought that it was him who did it so they tried hurting his family, and Junmo, and that the misunderstanding of the missing crystals was between her and Silverman. Sangwoo doesn't judge her for the theft of the Silvermoon, and Haizan Guild and doesn't believe she owes an apology. Wu Haiyan then held the jewel crystals as she ran to settle things off on her own. Back at the hunter agency, a couple of hunters are surprised as Sangwoo passes on both C and B rank hunter test qualifications, making him a B rank hunter with the clerk still not believing what he had witnessed. The other clerk informed the man that Sangwoo requested an overlapping entrance permit to the hunting grounds using his cloning skills. The news had spread, and even the hunter agency doctor was eager to share Sangwoo's exceptional skill, as he had never seen a skill like that before. Everyone was surprised by the rapid progress as Sangwoo had advanced from an E-rank hunter to a B-rank within just a day. This achievement was expected to create a significant buzz on the hunter web. After a week, a lot of things changed as Sangwoo's feat was posted on the hunter web along with the news of the Raid 1 team of Kinas Guild's successful return, and a following web post was about Sangwoo's cloning skill being the only one in the whole world and other news such as the Silver Moon Guild being disbanded. Sangwoo then received the mission reward from Kinas Guild, and could not believe what he saw on his phone, he received 5 billion won for the success of the mission, and then immediately called Wante about it. Wante confirmed this and stated Sangwoo's achievement had indeed been a remarkable one. He mentioned that Genmo hadn't informed Sangwoo about the contract when he accepted the mission, but Wante had believed in Sangwoo's capabilities and encouraged him to take it, as he felt no one else would have been able to handle it. Wante also extended an invitation for Sangwoo to visit their guild, mentioning that their raid team one would love to meet him. Sangwoo agreed to visit someday and felt overjoyed by what had occurred. This meant that he wouldn't have to worry about his sister's medical bills anymore. This financial relief would also open the possibility of maintaining her in the intensive care unit. Additionally, he contemplated the possibility of buying services from Bless, one of the world's S-class healers. At the Silver Moon Guild, Director Yang Jukiel is destroying evidence 
as their plan was already in shatters and the Wailolo and Kinas Guild are on the hunt for them. He wants to get out as quickly as possible when Han Miho, the guild master of Wailolo Guild comes in at his office. He tried to attack to surprise her but it was no use since Miho was already aware and took him down first. Junmo visited one day at the Kinas Guild office building and discussed his injury. He also brought up the fact that he had protected Sangwa's family during a recent incident and expressed his gratitude to Wante. Wante downplayed his actions and considered it as simply offering assistance. He confirmed to Junmo that the attackers were from the Silvermoon Guild, but Junmo suspected that there might be more to the story. He inquired about Chan Siang Kong, the person responsible for the incident, and the vice guild master of Silverman. Junmo's revelation that Chan Siang Kong was one of the hunters he worked with during his time with the Haizang Guild surprised Wante. He began to wonder if there was some connection between the Haizang and Silvermoon Guilds. At that moment, Han Miho entered the room and revealed that it was the Silvermoon Guild that was manufacturing jewel crystals supplied to the Haizang Guild, and she had discovered that there were other guilds involved in supplying jewel crystals to Haizang. Han Miho confirmed that Wanti's suspicions about Chukio's connection to the situation were correct. She greeted Junmo, and he reciprocated before asking if she had visited the Silverman Guild. Miho affirmed this and assured them that Chukio was alive and would be delivered to them soon. Wante inquired about DP, and Miho explained that it was a body-strengthening drug. She had a hunch that something wasn't right about the situation as there was no way a B-class guild like Silvermoon could manufacture jewel crystals without some external support. This led her to believe that the Haizang guild was deeply involved in the situation, making it even more dangerous than they had initially thought. The legalization of hunter activities and the establishment of a structured system occurred after the cataclysm ended. This system was developed in collaboration with various regulatory measures, including taxation on earnings from hunting and the legalization of activities like monster drops, among other things. These measures were intended to create stability in the hunter profession. However, not everyone was pleased with the idea of identity registration and hunting restrictions. Some hunters resisted the regulations and formed their own underground society. In this society, Unlicensed hunters developed their own system and engaged in illicit dealings using illegal weapons and information to safeguard their earnings. Yohayan entered a bar to sell the jewel crystals, but the bartender apologized, and a couple of men seized her. The bartender explained that he had been threatened, and a couple of unlicensed hunters who tried to intervene were quickly subdued by the masked men. Just as it seemed dire for Yohayan, Sangwoo made a surprise appearance, attacking one of the men who had threatened her. This intervention was a part of Sangwa's plan. Previously, when Yehayan had admitted to Sangwu about the stolen jewel crystals, he had mentioned that she was part of JM Agency and would assist her. Sangwu had instructed her to sell the stolen jewel crystals, knowing that it would lead the culprits right into his trap. In an undisclosed location, the director of the Haizang Guild, Shin Haizang, was undergoing a body check. He humorously questioned why he would bring a weapon, considering he was an A-class hunter, and jokingly suggested he could just drop a boulder on the place. Despite his playful remarks, he was instructed to proceed. Inside, the oracle recognized his presence and repeated the same answer as before, advising him to give up and be content with his current life. Shin Haizang responded to the oracle's advice by recounting how the oracle had once predicted that powerful individuals, including politicians, would bow before him. However, the predictions had suddenly changed. Haizang demanded to know why, and the oracle explained that his destiny had undergone a drastic shift, primarily due to someone's influence. When he pressed for the person's identity, the oracle couldn't specify, as it wasn't just one person but many. Meanwhile, back at the bar, Sangwu emerged victorious after defeating those who had attempted to kidnap Yuhayan. He handed one of the captor's cell phones and asked for the password. The man, however, expressed a preference to be killed instead. Sangwoo responded by indicating that he wasn't the type to do so. Instead, he suggested handing the man over to the unlicensed hunters who were eager to get their revenge. Shinjinik, the leader of Haisen Guild's Team 1, received a phone call with a somewhat choppy voice. He was informed that the jewel crystals had been successfully retrieved and Jinik instructed to transport them to Factory 3. 
Jinnik inquired about the unclear voice on the other end but dismissed it, emphasizing the importance of safeguarding the DP production. He mentioned that their guild CEO was extremely upset about the Silvermoon situation. Unknown to Jinnik, the call had been made by Sangwu. After verifying the information, Sangwu offered to return the jewel crystals in exchange for the location of the factory. The apprehended man initially hesitated but relented when Sangwu threatened him and pointed to two unlicensed hunters who were ready with their weapons drawn. After leaving, Sangwu and Yuhayan began their journey back. Yuhayan expressed her gratitude for Sangwu's help, but he downplayed it. She then confirmed that Sangwu was the person featured in the news story about the hunter who had been promoted two ranks in a single day. Sangwu pointed out that Wu Haiyan might not be the type to pay attention to others. Curious, Yu Haiyan asked Sangwu what her name was. Sangwu replied that she was the potion maker, which prompted Yu Haiyan to grab him by the neck and assert that her name was Yu Haiyan. Sangwu defended himself by saying they had never formally introduced themselves. Yu Haiyan then inquired about the whereabouts of his clones. Sangwu informed her that his clones were currently occupied at a barbecue restaurant fulfilling a promise he had made to them. Sangwu had promised his clones a meal before their mission at Odin's Tower, and now, at the barbecue restaurant, the clones were joyfully indulging themselves. Back at the Kinas Guild's office, Junmo confirmed that it was Shin Jinwook who had been on the other end of the recorded call sent by Sangwu. This revelation shed light on the connection between the Haizang Guild and the Jewel Crystals. It became evident that there were other B-class guilds that continued to operate in retrieving jewel crystals for the Haizan Guild, much like the Silvermoon Guild. Junmo suggested using this information as evidence to take down the Haizan Guild, but one day cautioned that it would be extremely difficult. The reason was that the Haizan Guild wasn't directly involved in manufacturing the crystals, and they enjoyed protection from the Korean Hunter Association. Even if they were to be imprisoned, they would likely be released in no time. Wante emphasized that when it came to this incident, they should proceed slowly but surely. He also expressed concern for Junmo's safety, offering to assign bodyguards to him immediately. Junmo accepted the offer but mentioned that he would inform Sangwoo about the bodyguard situation. Wante assured him that Sangwoo didn't require a bodyguard, as there wasn't anyone capable of kidnapping him in the first place. Sangwoo received a text from Junmo, informing him about their discussion at the Kinas Guild office. Sangwu then advised Yuhaiyan not to leave the office for a while, and she suspected that matters related to the Silvermoon Guild were not yet resolved. Sangwu then mentioned the new agency office they had acquired and mentioned that she would be surprised. Upon arriving at the new agency office, they were warmly greeted by Junmo. The office was spacious, occupying the entire floor, as Junmo had been planning to move for some time. They humorously discussed how they were on their way to becoming a top-ranked national agency, particularly due to Sangwa's rising popularity. Yuhayan was then led to another room where she discovered a fully equipped laboratory with the latest potion-making technology and equipment. Junmo had arranged this space for her and assured her that if she needed anything else, she could simply inform him. There was also a separate room for her to live in. Yuhayan was touched and thanked him. Junmo received an unexpected phone call that surprised him. He quickly instructed Sangwu to go to the hospital. Meanwhile, at the storage facility where Sangwu and Chanxiang had previously battled, Shin Haizan called for someone to come forward, and a shadow responded to his command, transforming into a masked man. Haizan inquired about the whereabouts of Yang Jukil. The masked man informed him that he was locked up in the underground of Yolo Guild, and that all the documents related to DP had been taken, along with the jewel crystals. He also reported that one of the factories had been located. Shin Haizan clenched his teeth and handed two potions to the masked man, instructing him on who to use them on. He declared that if someone desired DP so fervently, he would provide it, even if it was not perfected yet. In the Wailo Guild basement, Yan Jukio was taken aback as the masked man emerged from the shadows. Confused and surprised, Jukiel asked why the man was there. The masked individual responded that the CEO had sent him. Initially hopeful that he was going to be rescued, Jukiel's hope turned to shock as the masked man used the potion provided by Haizan on him. Outside the Wailo Guild building, Park Wante arrived with Han Miho to interrogate Jukiel. As they were discussing, Miho suddenly detected a burning smell. 
She quickly looked towards the guild building's front and saw it on fire. Alarmed, she rushed inside and was met with a nightmarish sight. A devil-like creature stood in front of her, and some of her guild members lay injured on the ground. One of the wounded guild members informed Miho that a monster had suddenly appeared in the basement, and that the B-class hunters had been unable to stop it. Miho was perplexed about the situation, as she couldn't understand how an A-class monster had appeared without a nearby portal. In the hospital, the masked man appeared before Chansiang Kong, who was in a comatose state. He was intent on using the same method as he had with Jukio. However, before he could proceed, Siena intervened to stop him. Although he momentarily halted his actions, he then attempted to use the potion on the guild member. Just as he was about to carry out his intentions, Sangwu intervened, delivering a powerful and decisive attack. The monster that Han Miho and Park Wante encountered outside of the Wyolo Guild building was indeed Yang Jukio. Miho confirmed and said that he was not A-class but was on the upper end of B-class and by the scar on the monster's face, she confirmed that it was him considering that he appeared at the guild basement. Wante then thinks about the conversation they had regarding DP as he looks into the transformed Jukio and says that Haizang must be planning to take care of the Silvermoon which also means Chansiang Kang is in danger, but Miho said that Siena was already there since she saw a suspicious person and contacted Genmo immediately. Han Miho launched a powerful magic attack that pierced the creature's chest. However, the monster displayed rapid regeneration and immediately counterattack. Before it could strike back, Park one day intervened, swiftly slicing off the creature's hand with incredible speed and using his skill. Half Moon Slash The monster retaliated by using a skill that Jukiel was known for, confirming the transformation's identity. The monster was poised to unleash another skill when a sudden attack from above struck it down, killing it instantly. The guild master from the Sun Guild, Kim Milgan, had arrived on the scene. He demanded an explanation from Miho and one day about the events that had unfolded. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Sangwu and Siena continued to battle with the masked man. Siena unleashed a fireball, but it was promptly dispelled by the masked man. Sangwu managed to kick the masked man forcing him to retreat. The masked man, acknowledging Sangwa's formidable power, understood why Chan Siang had been defeated. Sangwa's clones also arrived on the scene. The masked man, realizing he was at a disadvantage, prepared to make his escape, citing the abundance of shadows in the area, especially around the intensive care unit where Sangwa's sister was located. Sangwu made a quick attempt to apprehend the masked man, but his enemy managed to escape. The situation was de-escalated after the incident, with the monster outbreak in the city quickly dealt with by the Sun, Kinas, and Wyolo guilds. While Kim Ilgen voiced his suspicions about Shin Haisung, the incident was generally perceived as a straightforward monster outbreak, and no clear connections were drawn to any specific individuals or guilds. Yang Jukio was officially declared a missing person, as there was no clear explanation for his disappearance. The authorities were able to locate the place where the jewel crystals were being manufactured, but by the time they arrived, it had been emptied out, leaving only the machines behind. Several other reports emerged about random monsters appearing in various parts of the city, but any information linking these incidents to a broader conspiracy was promptly removed. The events were thus shrouded in mystery. Sangwu took the security of his team seriously after the Silver Moon incident. However, due to budget constraints, they couldn't afford to hire professional bodyguards. To address this issue, Sangwu decided to utilize his clones strategically. He distributed six of his clones to different key locations, including their home, the hospital, and other important spots. Two of the clones were assigned to go hunting and exercise regularly. Junmo was aware that Sangwu could now summon a seventh clone, but Sangwu revealed that this particular clone was assigned to a familiar place, Odin's Tower. He explained that this clone was equipped with a blue potion that Yohayan had created. Inside the tower, the clone successfully lured the monsters, and then, using the potion, self-destructed to eliminate the monsters. The opening ceremony of the Hunter's Academy Korea branch was officially launched under the leadership of its academy president, Won Haksu. The primary objective of this academy was to provide education for low-rank hunters on effectively dealing with monsters and enhancing their skills all without charging a fee. The academy was open to individuals with lower-tier skills or ranks, 
as the goal was to help them improve. It was announced that at the end of each year, the person who demonstrated the most outstanding achievements would receive a prestigious reward, an elixir. Inside the new JM agency office, Sengwu was working out in the personal office gym, he felt that the dumbbells were light. When the local news on the TV announced the inauguration of the Hunter Academy Korean branch, Sangwoo didn't mind the announcement at first and was about to turn off the TV when he suddenly heard about the prize for the most excellent student of the year, an elixir. As Junmo, Yuhayan, and Sangwoo look at the advertisement for the Hunter Academy, Junmo confirms to Sangwoo that the grand prize for the top student is the elixir. Sangwoo was confused about why an academy gives out an elixir. Junmo explains that the academy was founded by the enlightened group led by Jumper and that the admission preference states the lower the rank and the fewer the skills the hunter has, the more likely he will be accepted at the university. Sangwoo also heard this on the news and is quite regretful that if he had known about it, he would have increased his rank later. Junmo replied that even if he is B-rank it would be fine since his other preferential conditions are still accepted such as his skill set. Normally hunters around Sangwoo's rank possess at least an average of 70 skills but Sangwoo has below 20. Junmo highlighted that having a low number of skills could actually work in Sangwoo's favor for admission. Additionally, being from a foreign origin might make them eligible for a donation-based admission system. Junmo then asked if Sangwoo still had the reward he got from the Keenest Guild. A couple of days later, Sangwoo arrived at the Hunter Academy, Korean branch, and was greeted by the Hunter Academy's Chancellor Won Hak Soo. He humbly replied that he should be the one thanking him for his acceptance, but Hak Soo insisted his point as Sangwoo spent 2.5 billion as a donation for the Academy. The Academy has a donation system, similar to other universities, but it doesn't receive the same treatment as a national university. Junmo was able to negotiate a two. 5 billion donation in exchange for Sangwoo's admission. Sangwoo assumed he didn't have a competitor in the academy as the rank of the students ranged from F to E, with D rank being the highest. When he was suddenly informed by Hak Su that there was another B rank student of the same year as him, he was surprised and Hak Su informed him that another B rank hunter had also been admitted by donation. Hak Su spared other details but assured him that the hunter was as famous as him. In one of the classrooms at the academy, Professor Khan He Suk introduces himself as the teacher who will teach them basic elemental magic. He prefers to not start the classes right away and announces that he will just go over the class schedule and will start actual classes next week as Sangwoo was thinking about the sudden challenge he has to go through due to the sudden appearance of another B-rank hunter at the academy. As their professor leaves, another student comes in and announces that there will be a welcome party for the new students the same evening at a local bar near the academy. Sangwoo thinks of this as an opportunity to meet the other B-rank hunter the Chancellor talked about earlier. However, at the welcome party, it was all a bunch of women who kept asking him about his previous battles and some men who were jealous of Sangwoo, he then tried to ask everyone about what they knew regarding another B-rank hunter who entered the academy but no one knew about it as well. Sangwoo decided to leave the party and was asked by a random student for directions to the welcome party. Sangwoo confirmed the location and explained that he was leaving early because he didn't really know anyone there. To his surprise, the student turned out to be Heian, and she invited him for a drink. Sangwoo was shocked to see Heian, the student whom he had privately tutored before, and asked why she was there. She informed him that she was also a student of the academy as he asked about her application to Gyeongguk University. Heian ignored his questions and suggested having drinks as talk. At the bar, Heian and Sangwoo caught up to each other. Turns out she was accepted at Gyeongguk, but it was her dream to be a hunter. Her parents wanted her to go to college, but she was planning to be a hunter after taking leave of absence after she graduates. The Hunter Academy was created so Heian convinced her parents to let her do what she wanted since she was accepted into the college they wanted. They argued a lot about it, but eventually, her parent gave in and let her go to the academy. She then asks Sangwoo what he has been doing for the last six months as she calls him teacher. They joke around a little more regarding their honorifics as they continue to talk and drink throughout the night. Heian gets drunk as she tries to order another drink but Sangwoo stops her. She then takes his phone to get his contact information, while telling Sangwoo he has no more excuses not to contact her anymore as she falls asleep. Heian woke up with Sangwoo carrying her on his back. 
She became flustered and pretended to be drunk and asked him why he hadn't contacted her in the last six months, even though he had many ways to do so. She admitted to wanting to punch him for what he did, but seeing him in person changed her mind. She also confessed to enjoying their time together and questioned whether, if they hadn't met that day, he had any intention of contacting her again. Sangwoo explained his absence and mentioned that he had something to do, but he admitted that he had truly enjoyed the day, which had been the best in the past six months. He expressed his desire for a simpler life and his fear of repeating past mistakes, which led him to cut off some relationships. However, he reassured Hien that their relationship was still precious to him. Hien was flustered as they both agreed to catch up the next time they hung out. In the Haizong Guild office, Shin Haizong was reviewing articles related to Sangwu when a masked man entered, expressing apologies for underestimating Sangwu's abilities. Another individual also entered the office, and they discussed Sangwu's admission to the academy. The person who promised not to let Haizong down and referred to him as father was Shin Junying, a B-class hunter from the Haizong Guild. At the beginning of the academy classes, the professor introduced basic elemental magic. Sangwu was surprised to see Heian in his class. The professor demonstrated casting a fireball and explained its properties. He then instructed the class to retrieve their skill balls. Those who already possessed the skill did not need to come forward. Sangwu was confused about what was happening in the class. The class professor explained how skill balls worked, enabling users to gain new skills without needing any prerequisites like innate abilities. However, the initial buzz around skill balls in the hunting industry generated a lot of attention because they seemed to offer the possibility for anyone to acquire the skills they desired. In reality though, the high manufacturing difficulty led to inflated prices, making them unaffordable for many lower-ranked hunters. The skill balls had become a luxury that only rich and well-off hunters could afford, and their effectiveness in enhancing hunting efficiency further drove up their prices. This situation led to a smaller number of hunters being able to purchase them. People had hoped that skill balls would bridge the gap between high and low-ranked hunters, but instead, they exacerbated the inequality. In the academy, however, students no longer needed to worry about the cost, as the professor distributed boxes full of skill balls to the class. Sangwoo used one of the skill balls to obtain the fireball skill, just like the other students. They then relocated to the skill training ground at the academy where a massive block of ice awaited them. The professor went on to explain that previously, mastering elemental skills required a sensitive control of mana that matched the user's traits as a prerequisite. However, with the assistance of the system, it could now automatically handle mana control for the user. The professor demonstrated by using a fireball on the large block of ice, explaining that practice was now the primary way to upgrade skills like the fireball. Skill level would improve the more the user used the skill, determining its strength. He then instructed the class that they would be attempting to increase the level of their skill by using a fireball on the massive block of ice in front of them. The students took their turns using the fireball skill, and when it was Hayen's turn, she impressed the professor with her proficient use of the skill. She explained that her skill's activation process was similar to how the fireball worked, which allowed her to create a strong one. Next up was Sangwoo and there was anticipation from both the students and the professor because it was uncommon to see a B-class hunter using a skill. The professor instructed the class to step back, expecting a significant display of power from Sangwoo. Sangwoo concentrated his mana and visualized forming it into a ball, releasing it as he would with striking skill. However, to everyone's surprise, nothing happened, and there were smirks all around due to his sudden failure. The professor clarified that Sangwoo had done everything correctly, but the skill's level was too low for his high stats. His excess mana caused an oversupply, extinguishing the flame. To succeed, Sangwoo would need to trust the system and level up his fireball skill. Sangwoo, feeling down after his earlier failure, was comforted by Heian. However, their conversation was interrupted by the introduction of Shin Junying, another B-rank hunter in the class. Sangwoo realized he was the other B-class in the academy. The professor recognized him and offered a skill ball, but Junying revealed that he had already mastered the skill. Junying then displayed an immense, nearly perfect fireball skill, much to everyone's astonishment. Sangwoo continued to feel disheartened during lunch with Heian, 
but she reassured him, emphasizing that not everyone could use the skill and that practice was crucial. Sang Wu had an idea and activated his familiar skill and instructed the clones, numbers 5 and 6 to use the fireball skill, and they executed it perfectly. He was surprised but determined, so he commanded all his clones to continuously use the fireball skill for 24 hours while they hunted. Sang Wu was grinning, planning his comeback once his skill was on par with his level. He intended to Sang Wu's injured left hand, which had been hurt from his relentless training of the fireball skill. Despite the injury, Sang Wu continued his training with his right hand since he had decided to practice along with his clones for everything. He thanked He Yin for the advice on how to maintain the skill. The second practical lecture began, and everyone in the class anticipated Zhen Ning's performance, hoping to see a repeat of his previous demonstration. However, Zhen Ning decided not to participate this time, believing that he had already demonstrated the gap between himself and Sang Wu with the plan he executed the day before, intentionally showing up after Sang Wu's turn. In the next practical lecture, Sang Wu displayed an incredible fireball with the same destructive power as his previous one, leaving everyone, including the professor, astonished. Since it had only been three days since the last practical lecture, making his rapid improvement surprising to all. Sang Wu attributed his progress to his hard work and motivation, especially after witnessing Zhen Ying's performance the day before. Zhen Ying gritted his teeth, clearly frustrated. After the class, He Yin and Sang Wu walked around the academy, talking about the day's events. After Sang Wu left He Yin, he was approached by Zhen Ying, who was waiting for him around the corner. Zhen Ying attempted to persuade Sang Wu to give up on chasing the elixir, offering him extravagant incentives but Sang Wu remained determined to obtain it. Their argument and threats continued as they made their way to their respective classes. In the JM Agency Laboratory, Yu Haiyan handed Sang Wu a potion, he thanked her as the potion helped improve his poison resistance, but Yu Haiyan was visibly upset and took the opportunity to boast about her own improvements. They engaged in a light-hearted argument about potion making. Sang Wu then inquired about the news concerning the Haizong Guild DP situation. Yu Haiyan seemed uninterested and shrugged it off, expressing her belief that another opportunity would come their way someday. This left Sang Wu pondering Yu Haiyan's backstory and connection with the Haizang Guild. Sang Wu asked Yu Haiyan about Xin Zhenying and learned that he was the second son of Xin Haizang. Yu Haiyan also shared information about Zhenying's sudden disappearance. She mentioned his awakened skill, the Great Sage, which allowed him to instantly reach the highest level with any skill he learned. Sang Wu was shocked by this revelation and gazed at the potion he had received, contemplating a strategy to confront Zhen Yi. At the one in hunting ground in Area B, two hunters discussed their plan to steal monster drops from the kills made by Sang Wu's clones. They had noticed that the clones typically cleared the area first before the monster retrieval team arrived, leaving an opportunity for others to snatch the loot before it was collected. On the other hand, as the clones contacted the monster retrieval team about their kills, they were informed that there were no corpses in the area, which came as a surprise. Perplexed by this situation, the clones called Sang Wu and asked him if they should apprehend the thieves. Sang Wu agreed to their plan but instructed them not to kill anyone. The two hunters who successfully stole monster drops from Sang Wu's clones received a phone call, and it was revealed that the one who had taught them how to do it was Jun Yi. Jun Yin had been observing Sang Wu's hunting process by analyzing the clone's past achievements, which led him to develop the theory that allowed the theft to occur. Back at the JM agency office, Sang Wu was troubled by the situation and confided in Jun Mo about it. He believed that this incident was not a mere coincidence but rather a planned act, likely in response to something he had done before. Sang Wu seemed to be overreacting, thinking that he was being punished for past actions but Junmo suggested a solution to his storage instructing him to ask a favor from a specific person. Sangwu visited the Kina's guild to meet with Park Yuna. She warmly greeted him and congratulated him on his promotion to B-class. Sangwu wasted no time and asked her directly about learning her subspace skill. However, Yuna denied his request, explaining that awakening skills like hers couldn't be learned by others. These skills were unique and operated on unknown principles making it impossible to teach or explain their fundamentals. She also mentioned that she couldn't use the clone skill Sang Wu possessed for the same reasons. 
Yuna informed Sangwu that learning a similar skill to hers would be quite beneficial, as there were some differences in aspects. This implied that it might be possible for Sangwu to acquire a skill resembling Yuna's in some way. Sangwu then traveled to the USA, specifically to the Heritage's main building. He had initially expected Yuna to accompany him but found himself alone. Despite the language barrier, Sangwu felt confident enough to navigate through the building with the help of the translation feature on his hunter bracelet. He then proceeded to the upper floors. Upon reaching the 170th floor, Sangwu was greeted by Arya Burchill, the CEO of the company, after being contacted by the Keenest Guild. She hoped that Sangwu would find the skill ball he was looking for at the Heritage. In a hunting ground in Korea, two of Sangwu's clones were actively hunting. The hunters who had previously stolen their loot continued to follow them, collecting whatever kills they could, even if some were too damaged by the clone's use of the fireball skill. As the two hunters ventured deeper into the hunting ground, they encountered another party of hunters engaged in similar activities. There was a brief standoff between the groups as they attempted to intimidate each other. However, one of the hunters decided not to resort to violence, and suggested that they divide and share the monster drops collected from Sangwa's clones more equitably. Upon their return to the dungeon entrance, they found the clones preparing their weapons. This surprised them, but they tried to act as if nothing had happened and went their separate ways. However, their escape was halted when two knives were thrown to block their path. The clones recognized the distinctive shoes worn by the hunters from the footprints they had left in the hunting area. They asked the hunters to accompany them for questioning. The two clones took the hunters by surprise as they attempted to call for guards. However, one of the clones dialed a phone number and had Yuhayan on the line, who confirmed that the items they had sold on the black market were indeed the stolen monster drops that the clones had hunted. The group then moved to a vacant area where the clones attempted to negotiate and de-escalate the situation. They proposed that the other party return the money they had earned from selling the stolen loot, and in exchange, they would not take further action. The offer seemed reasonable, but one of the hunters from the other party responded by drawing his weapon and threatening the clones, believing that they had the number advantage. At the black market, Yohayan inquired with one of the store owners regarding any information he might have about the individuals who had sold him the monster corpses. She explained that the monsters were originally supposed to be hunted by Sangwu. However, since Sangwu was abroad, Yohayan took it upon herself to address the situation. In the Heritage Basement Skill Orb Factory, Sangwu discovered that nearly 80% of the skill orbs used worldwide were manufactured there. He also learned that the fireball skill could be learned without the use of skill balls, but many people still purchased them because learning skills could be challenging due to various factors, such as mana control. The ability to learn skills varied between individuals, with some having talent and others lacking it. Skill orbs were created to bridge this gap, and with the assistance of the system, they made it possible for people to use skills even if they had poor mana control. This complexity in creating skill orbs contributed to their high cost. Arya then proceeds to show Sangwu a subspace skill orb with a price of $10 million equivalent to 12.8 billion won with it already suited for his reference. Sangwu is a little bit hesitant with the price when suddenly Arya offers him a deal to give it to him free in exchange of a service. She offered him the subspace skill ball in exchange of Sangwu's body. Back in Korea, the party against the two clones was having a hard time due to their skill level. They tried to attack in various ways but the clones were able to react and counterattack on time to their attacks as the clones finally beat them all one by one. As one of the clones instructs the hunter to transfer the money, he is suddenly attacked by a woman whose name is Lee Hyun. Arya presented her offer to Sangwoo, which involved conducting research on his clone in exchange for a skill orb for free. She emphasized that Sangwa's cloning skill was the only one of its kind in the world and that this information had not spread beyond Korea, making it an opportune time to make this offer. Arya's plan was to create a skill ball based on Sangwa's skill, and she detailed the procedures involved. Sangwu was intrigued and asked her to explain more about awakening skills and crafted skill orbs. Arya clarified that it depended on their understanding of the skill. She used Park Yuna's subspace skill as an example highlighting that similar skills often had restrictions and conditions, unlike Yuna's unique skill. She mentioned that if they succeeded in creating a skill ball similar to Sangwa's cloning skill, 
it would likely come with its own set of restrictions. Sangwoo accepted Arya's offer, but he had one condition. In Korea, the two clones found themselves struggling to combat Hyun due to her immense power. Her presence allowed the other party to escape, and the clones attempted to fight back. However, they were overpowered by Hyun, who unleashed a powerful attack on one of them. Meanwhile, Sangwoo laid out his conditions for Arya regarding the rental of his clone for three months of research. He emphasized that if the clone were accidentally destroyed, he wouldn't provide another, and the skill orb would not be refunded. Arya understood the value Sangwoo placed on his unique skill and agreed to the terms and conditions of the deal. Sangwoo immediately summoned clone number seven, and Arya handed him the skill ball for the subspace skill. He activated it, and his status revealed the unlocking of the skill. Sangwoo activated the skill, causing a void-like portal to open in front of him, resembling Yuna's subspace but slightly smaller. This new skill consumed mana upon entering the portal. Sangwoo instructed clone number 7 to test the subspace skill as well. To Arya's surprise, clone number 7 successfully activated the skill. She learned that all of Sangwoo's skills could be replicated by his clones except for his unique cloning skill. This realization made Arya even more determined to win Sangwoo over, recognizing the incredible possibilities that his clones offered. Sangwoo then commanded number 7 to cross the subspace. But instead of emerging from the portal he had summoned, it reappeared from another entrance behind it. This discovery indicated that, regardless of which one of his clones used the subspace, they would all lead to the same place, essentially making it no different from a portal. As Sangwoo realizes this, clone number 7 is hit by an attack from Hyun in Korea, where his clones are battling her. Sangwoo, furious over clone number 7's injury, picked up Hyun's weapon and crossed through the subspace portal. He was visibly angered by the situation and Hyun's provocation. Upon reaching clone number 6, who was lying on the ground and unable to walk due to the damage it had sustained, Sangwoo used cloning cancellation and demanded an explanation of the situation. Clone number 5 recounted the whole story, including the revelation that Hyun was from the Hyun Guild, which further infuriated Sangwoo. Hyun continued to taunt him, calling him arrogant for not realizing the kind of opponent he was facing. Sangwoo then commanded number 6 to back him up, preparing to attack. Meanwhile, Junying received a message from the hunters, stating that they would never engage in such activities again, despite his extra measures for the operation's success. He was relieved that he had sent Hyun as a backup plan and described her as a monster. In the battle between Sangwoo and Hyun, both were taken aback when their attacks were blocked simultaneously. This indicated that Hyun was a hunter with exceptional stats and held the rank of A-class. She unleashed a powerful attack that caused the ground to crack, prompting both Sangwoo and clone number 5 to dodge and retreat. Hyun then used her command to call her weapon back to her, successfully pulling it away from Sangwoo. Sangwoo decided to open multiple subspace portals for all his clones to converge at his location, each bringing the requested item. As they prepared to attack Hyun Arya, who was watching on the other side of the portal, was astonished by the use of a dimensional pocket skill as a portal. She couldn't believe what she was witnessing, and this presented an opportunity for Sangwoo to feel indebted to her. Arya recalled the weapon that had been thrown earlier, which she recognized as coming from the Tron Company. This led her to make a phone call, inquiring about the prototype she had requested previously. In the intense battle between Sangwoo and his clones against Hyun, they continued to exhibit their speed and agility. However, Hyun unleashed her damage manipulation skill, which allowed her to transfer a portion of the damage she received to her surroundings. This skill caused significant explosions, but Sangwoo and his clones managed to block the damage with their abilities. Hyun surprised Sangwoo by dashing right in front of him. While he successfully dodged the first attack, he was unable to avoid the second one, taking significant damage. Sangwoo noticed that Hyun's wounds had once again mysteriously disappeared. To turn the tide of the battle, Sangwoo handed an item pouch containing jewel crystals to clone number 5. He explained the effects of the crystals and mentioned that Hyun, being from the Hyun Guild, should be aware of them. Sangwoo then issued a threat, stating how powerful his clone could become with the jewel crystals, to the point of transforming into a monster that wouldn't even recognize its owner. Hyun found herself confronted by a massive, 
demon-like creature. As Hyan faced the transformed demon-like creature, she assumed it would deal the same damage as before. However, she found herself being launched into the air by the attack, and sang -woo pointed out that her lack of knowledge about the creature's abilities had led to her miscalculation. sang -woo continued to elaborate on the situation but was suddenly attacked by clone number five. Hyan, frustrated, declared that she didn't care if sang -woo perished in their battle. She then leaped into action and attacked clone number five, causing some damage, but the clone was able to counterattack and slam her to the ground. Despite the damage she had taken, Hyan got back on her feet and launched another attack, causing clone number five to fall. She then dashed towards sang -woo, intent on killing him. However, sang -woo humorously suggested calling the police and the rest of his clones joined the attack, pushing Hyan back. One of sang -woo's clones attempted to attack Hyan from behind, but she caught the attack with her bare hand and swiftly countered, killing the clone. She observed that the clones never aimed for fatal strikes, deducing that sang -woo had never killed a person. sang -woo activated his cursed sword by self-inflicting a wound. His next attack was aimed at Hyan's neck with the intention of delivering a fatal blow. Although she managed to block the attack, she was unaware that her location was near clone number five, who then stomped her to the ground. Despite her struggles, Hyan was still able to block the attacks. As the battle intensified, the other clones used fireballs to create a distraction. Clone number five, positioned above Hyan, unleashed a massive wave of fire from its mouth. Hyan managed to absorb the damage using her sword and then transferred the fireball towards Sang Wu. However, as the fireball was about to strike him, Arya, who was watching from the other side of the portal, threw a prototype armor in the form of a cape called MPCP. This light cape possessed great elasticity and was equipped with absorbing and shielding skills that adjusted themselves depending on the user's situation. Arya emphasized that it couldn't even be compared to the weapon that Hyan was using. Hyan was taken by surprise at the turn of events. She failed to notice that clone number five was still positioned above her as it continued its attack. Her weapon was flooded with absorbed damage but had nowhere to transfer it. The weapon erupted, and clone number five continued in its assault, disabling her from using her skill. Hyan attempted to retaliate by kicking clone number five with the last of her strength. However, when she looked above, she saw sang -woo, who commended her for her efforts. He then delivered a powerful punch. Like and subscribe if you want me to continue the next chapters and thank you for watching.